welcome our next speaker, who is Dr. Leanne Cognette from Trinidad and Tobago. In addition to working in internal medicine, uh, she was sworn in as the president of the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association in 2014. She's also a member of the Thoracic Society of Trinidad and Tobago. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, Michael, Dr. Chris, colleagues, Good morning. The twin islands of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago are the most, two most southerly isles of the Caribbean, situated off the coast of South America. Trinidad's Amerindian's name was Airy, or Land of the Hummingbird. The present name for Tobago is thought to be a corruption of the old name Tobacco. Our country is known for its carnival. We are the birthplace of the steel pan, music styles of Calypso, Soca, and Chutney Soca. We have famous sportsmen such as Brian Lara, who has the highest individual score in first class cricket with 501 not out. Our tourist attractions include Pigeon Point, Maracas Beach, the County Swamp. Diversity is the status quo. We are a rainbow island. We have 37.6% Indo-Trinidadians, 36.3% Afro-Trinidadians, less than 1% Caucasian, 24% mixed ethnicity, and 1.2% others, such as Chinese and Syrians. Even though we're one of the richest islands in the Caribbean, we have a few alarming health facts. The Ministry of Health, in collaboration with PAHO, WHO, the Caribbean Epidemiology Center, the University of the West Indies, and the Central Statistical Office conducted a nationwide survey of risk factors for developing non-communicable diseases called Pan American Steps. And according to Steps, the average BMI for women is 27.4 kilograms per meter square, for men 25.6 kilograms per meter square with women accounting for 59% of our obese population. Evidence has also shown that childhood obesity is also a serious medical condition. As one in four children, five to 18 years in Trinidad and Tobago are overweight or obese. A 2009 cross-sectional survey done on 67,000 school children aged five to 17 years basically showed that there's a prevalence of 10.4 out of 1,000 school children with type 2 diabetes and 7.5 out of 100,000 with impaired glucose tolerance. We have hypertension, which accounts for 26.3% prevalence rate in our population. In 2014, the International Diabetes Federation reported that the prevalence of diabetes in adults 20 to 79 years was 14.2%. And as we see in this graph, the highest proportion of persons with diabetes are over the age of 60 years. And with this increasing prevalence of diabetes, there's an associated increase in prevalence of diabetes-associated pregnancies. And do we have chronic lung disease in our country? The answer is yes. We have two studies that basically show that the prevalence of COPD is about 20% in acute medical admissions as well as in chronic clinics. And smoking, the overall prevalence is 21.1%. So we can see, according to the Pan Am steps, that the public expenditure, the economic burden of these non-communicable diseases in 2011 was 400 million TT dollars. And if we look at 2004, it was 34 million TT dollars. So what have we done? It was the world icon, Nelson Mandela, who said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And we believe that education can help change the mindset of our population. The WHO Bangkok 
charter refers to this as health promotion. The Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association takes pride in being one of the leading providers of high quality, continuing professional development in our country, as we believe that education is a lifelong responsibility. Being on the cutting edge of knowledge and information technology gives us the ammunition to go out into the communities and to educate our population. We host three medical health fairs throughout Trinidad and Tobago in collaboration with other NGOs. Here, we give medical care to at least 100 persons per clinic, as well as give lectures on non-communicable diseases and lifestyle changes. In addition, our group goes to children's home to teach and examine their occupants. In addition to what is done by our association, the ministry has embarked on a school health program. One is an arm of the Ministry of Health that consists of hearing and vision screening for all first year primary school students. And the goal is to improve the quality of life and learning outcomes of students. And the second is a school nutrition program that involves both the ministries of health and education. It serves daily meals to students enrolled in over 800 pre-primary, primary, secondary, and special schools. As media is an important educational tool, our National Medical Association and the Ministry of Health use it to communicate information, increase awareness, and affect large numbers of people. The Caribbean Medical Journal is the official journal of the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association. The editor-in-chief is a member of the association and executive and the president of the Commonwealth Medical Associ Association, Dr. Suleiman Juman. We encourage our physicians to submit original local scientific articles and case reports to this journal. And by increasing electronic access to this journal, we are hoping to increase the exposure to research done in Trinidad and Tobago so we can do something. The Medical Association also holds an annual medical update conference and to update our healthcare prof our professionals on local projects. We support the research done by two organizations in our country, the Diabetes Education Research Group and the Bold TT Group. Our Ministry of Health publishes educational ads via the media. For example, the Tobacco Control Act of 2009, which prohibits smoking in enclosed public spaces, as well as an ad that shows the rise in obesity of the citizens in Trinidad and Tobago. How else do we promote health? We have a We Fit Camp, which is a childhood healthy lifestyle camp that usually has about 50 children ages 7 to 12. And we usually screen the children at this camp and assess them as overweight or obese and teach them on lifestyle changes. In Tobago, we have a healthy eating active living camp called HEALC that had about 200 participants last year. We have the Fight the Fat campaign, which is a wellness revolution launched in 2011 as a call to lower the risk of chronic non-communicable diseases. We have a National Wellness Day, something called Fitness and Steel. So here, we encourage Trinidadians and Tobagonians to have fun, keep fit and healthy by tripping along the streets of Port Spain into the sound of steel band music. We have a ride, walk, and run for life to support breast cancer awareness. And of course, we have your Love Yourself ads that gives advice on eating, drinking water, and exercising. The TNTMA supports the government in all these ventures and is willing to work with all stakeholders. The Medical Association has recently embarked on joining with other associations to draft national standardized protocols. We were given the opportunity to collaborate with the Gynecological and Obstetric Society of Trinidad and Tobago, the University of the West Indies, and the Helen Bagwan Singh Diabetes Educational Research Group to screen for gestational diabetes. This is a new initiative, but we hope to raise awareness of, educate doctors, and get a consensus on gestational diabetes. The National Alcohol and Drug Abuse Prevention Program coordinates 
drug abuse prevention and demand reduction initiatives in Trinidad and Tobago by public education, information dissemination, treatment, and rehabilitation. The extended program on immunization <coughs> was initiated in the 1970s, and now immunization is a legal requirement for school entry. The Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association is aggressively involved in advocacy and we continue to advocate for healthcare issues that affect all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Movements were initiated to strengthen national health information system using the Health Metrics Network. What about health equity strategies? Well, the public of Trinidad and Tobago has access to 24-hour health care at the Accident of Emergency Department of the hospitals and district health facilities. This picture here shows the over 100 primary care facilities we have in our country. So this is over 100 health centers, um, general hospitals, as well as um, district health facilities available to all citizens in Trinidad and Tobago for free. We have the CEDAR program, which is a chronic disease assistance program. And this inception in 2003, it provided 20 pharmaceutical items to treat diabetes, hypertension, cardiac disease to citizens over the age of 65. But now, we have other treatment areas of asthma, depression, BPH and arthritis. And now we take into consideration all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. There are over 53 pharmaceutical items. And citizens get access to this program by a MyTT card, which is a national smart card that allows you access to free government services. The CEDA program also provides free diabetes test equipment for those with insulin dependent diabetes. So what's the next step? To promote participation in policy making by the National Medical Association as well as the civil society groups. Assessments to identify barriers in all programs. To improve performance of our healthcare system. Follow up research and ICT technology. And we're just at the beginning. So according to the words of one of our Calypsonias, the journey now starts. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. It's very interesting that responsible drinking in Trinidad and Tobago means hydrating appropriately rather than uh... All right, our, our final speaker for the morning, and after which we'll take a few questions, is Advocate Leah Wapner from uh, Israel. She's the Secretary General of the Israeli Medical Association. She's also the head of joint projects for the IMA and World Health Organization. Secretary General and Legal Advisor of the European Forum of Medical Associations and Advisor to the Finance and Planning Committee of the WMA. The podium is yours. Thank you very much. Actually, sitting up there, I was thinking, um, what can I tell you that you haven't heard till now? And uh, some of the things I would like to skip a little bit, so I'm going to go through it a little bit faster. But I was thinking, the first thing that came to my mind was that what do I have in common with everybody in this room? And that is that we are all very passionate for this topic. But that is not the case when you leave this room. It is not an easy sell. It's not so simple. I mean, we're all talking to ourselves. We're all engaged in it. We all are very, very passionate. And I want to start by telling you a personal story. Thirteen years ago, Professor Leon Epstein came into my room and he said, well, you know, you are the General Secretary of the Israeli Medical Association and you have to address the issue of inequalities in health. And he was talking for about a half an hour and when he was done, I said, okay, but why me? And his answer was very candid. He said, well, I went to everybody else and nobody else is interested. And um, to be very <laughs> frank, that's what actually turned me on. I said, okay, if nobody else wants to meet this challenge, I'm going to try to do it. 
And when I say nobody else, he went to the health ministry, he went to the sick funds, he went to the uh, medical society, he really went to everyone. And I couldn't believe it, but that's how it started, because when I went with him to the various stakeholders, including our medical association, the first question was, why? What? What are you talking about? And I want to address some of these concerns today because you, some of them are still out there. Now, the good news is that 13 years afterwards, every single stakeholder in Israel attributes the, the progress to himself, which is great. So if you go to the government, the government has said, oh, yes, we put this on the national uh, planning, and we have the, these laws, and we have these financial agendas, and it's only because we woke up one morning and we thought this was important. But it's great, because you need the government. You go to the different sick funds, and every sick fund is competing. Who is the first sick fund who put it on their agenda, who actually was willing to put in time and resources and money into it, which is also great because that means that it is important. You go to some, not all, some of our medical societies, and they are going to tell you this is part of our agenda, which is also fine. As I said, it's not everybody, but it's definitely a big, big change in the last 13 years. But I want to explain also why in Israel it's such a tricky situation. It's a tricky situation because Israel has always has a lot of, what should I say, um, underlying issues and not only the regular problems. So the first thing is that Israel is now a population of close to 8 million people, but it is extremely diverse. I mean, you all know from the news, you'd probably think, okay, we have Jews and Arabs there, but that's not the case. We have Jews and Arabs and Druze and Cherkesses and 22 different ethnic groups. And within the different ethnic groups that you know, if you talk about Jews or you talk about Arabs, that's not one society. Each one in itself, you break it up and you end up to close to, I would imagine, a hundred subgroups. And everyone is different in their culture. Everyone is different in their beliefs. And God forbid that you should want to address the differences in health because we, nobody wants to say there is a difference that would be attributed to a different culture. We even have an issue about collecting data because how are you going to collect the data? What are you going to write in the chart? This might be seen as something which would be, of course, extremely negative. So we do have health issues. We do have political issues. Uh, um, and other issues that we want to address. The first speech that we had, we went to, Professor Epstein and myself, we went to a conference of the hospital directors. And when he spoke about it, the response was extremely negative because they said, you want to tell us that there is any different? All our patients are equal. We treat everybody equal. Everybody is equal. There is absolutely nothing going on there. And yes, all our physicians are equipped with dealing with the differences, if it's a social economical difference, if it's a racist difference, if it's a, a, an ethnic difference, a religious difference, a gender difference, everything is the same. So that, of course, was the second problem that we have to deal with. And so you have a problem collecting data. You have a problem of, of thinking how you're going to deal with it. You have a problem with politicians maybe wanting to benefit out of this one way or another, which is not what we need. And I have to tell you that with all uh, the problems that we do have in Israel, I should say challenges, health has always been a beacon of stability, a beacon where there has not been ever a problem that we feel of inequity as far as the differences, as I would say, ethnic groups going. So to touch on that was really, really dangerous. Nevertheless, we said we're going to start to see what we can do in the area. And then you come to the physicians. And the physicians have very valid concerns. And I don't think that I've heard enough of them today. I've heard some, but not enough. And let me begin with saying, first of all, you as physicians know that the most important thing is that they want evidence. They want clear, cut evidence, and at the beginning it was a little bit difficult to give you evidence to, that would say to support the fact 
that, yes, inequality kills and inequality is expensive. So I think we're a little bit out of that now, but this still is always a cry for evidence. The other thing is they want results. They want to know that what they are going to do or get engaged or use their valuable time or, or efforts is going to actually improve health. And as was said before by our colleagues from Canada, it will improve the health of their individual patients. Because if you're going to have a physician that's going to spend time on this, he wants to know that this is going to be helpful for his patients. And I want to say one more thing which hasn't been mentioned enough up here. And that is that we are all competing for resources. And we are all competing in our government to, uh, uh, for our politicians to decide where are they going to put their dollars. And if we tell them that the problem is housing, and if we tell them that the problem is social uh, determinants in general, then that might say, okay, we don't have to invest so much in health care, or we don't have to invest that much in the physicians or in the facilities. Let's put that money elsewhere. Let's put it, as I said, for housing or anything else. Physicians don't like that. And I think that you could all understand, because they say we are not the ones who should be worried about that. And if we're just talking about poverty, other um, social uh, groups should be responsible for that. We have to be responsible for the health care. So when you're all competing for the, for the same thing, you have to understand that by saying we, we need A, B, C, at that moment we might be saying we can divert some of the money that we think that should be in to a diagnostic uh, uh, facility rather than putting it in and putting it in somewhere else, which is not an easy sell at all. The other last thing that I want to just say about it is that when you describe this also as a, a national problem or a general problem, then once again, people will shy away from it because they say, okay, we're not going to reduce poverty. We are not going to build houses. So why should we at all? Somebody else should be engaged with it. So I think that all these things are, are challenges that we have to meet and, and I, I would like to show you what we've done on this. So, if you look at, at Israel in general, you can see that Israel has very good health results. And I think everybody looking at the charts and looking compared to the OECD, we've always been um, with very good health results, which is another reason why our medical association and our doctors said, what do we want? Israel is doing fine. Okay, I'm not going to go through it. It's all available, so I'm sure you'll be able to get it if you need it. If you look, as I said, at the life expectancy, you can see that we are steadily growing. Uh, if you can see, also we're above the average, so I hope that everybody can see the slides out there as well. Um, once again, if you see the OECD and look where Israel is, all the way up there, so no problem there. And if you go infant mortality, we're way down. And I can go on and on and on, and you can just see about in the different diseases, which is great. If you look at the economy, all in all, Israeli economy is also considered very stable and very good, despite all its problems. So, theoretically, we shouldn't be having too much trouble as it is. But, of course, that is not completely the case. Because when you look according to the Gini Index and all the other economists out there, we know exactly what we're talking about, which basically means the inequality in income, the inequality, then you can see that Israel is not doing very well. Actually, here we are very much down to the bottom, which is a problem. And then you can understand that if we go back to this, we also understood that if there is a situation, there must also be a difference in what's actually happening with health. Okay. Uh, the first thing that I have to say is that what we did was we started to measure. We thought it was extremely important to measure what's happening with health care. And I will skip because I, I just see that I have only five minutes left, so I will do that. Um, so, oh, one minute, one minute, one minute. This you can all get later on. I'll do that. I'll go back to it. So what we thought is that our role as a medical association is to be advocates, and we have to raise the awareness of this. And from the year 2003, we yearly um, have a survey and where we try to find out exactly what happens within the society. Who of the society is 
one way or another foregoing treatment, not taking their medications, anything. And of course, the minute we started to collect evidence, the evidence was out there, and then the rest of the, uh, of the country was picking up and having their own surveys. And today we have the Israeli, the, the health ministry having a yearly survey and can tell you exactly who is not taking the medication, which are very, very clearly are, are the poorest, um, who has problems with access of care, where do you see the higher morbidity and mortality, and of course you can see it by region, you can see it in, in all the different diversities, and you can see it. So I definitely think that our first role as a medical association is to advocate, uh, to promote training among our physicians to explain why we need to be culturally literate. And just to let you, just to let you know, um, there are a lot of programs out there. We are joining, collaborating with the government in order to have different ways and um, online courses and so on in order to allow our population and especially our physicians to be more well acquainted with the different cultural aspects. Um, of our different uh, population, as I said. We also think that it's impo extremely important to attach financial incentives to results in meeting the challenge of inequality. And I, and, okay, well, go, I want to go here. Let's do this. So what we're doing is, in our collective bargaining agreements, which we as a medical association sign, we attach financial incentives to different physicians, for instance, if they go up north, if they go down south, if they go to areas which have less physicians, because we think that this is important. Now, this does not go without criticism, because as you could imagine, as I said, not every uh, physician in Israel feels that the Israeli Medical Association should be dealing with this and not the government of something else, but I still think it's important. We address our scientific associations and we ask them to identify the problem and to try to set out uh, guidelines for their members. The reason we're doing this because we found out that physicians will most likely adhere to guidelines of their own association. And if you have the family doctors saying this and this is what you should be looking for, this is what you should see, these are the health risks, then they will be doing it more especially then if the government says it or if their sick fund says it, but even for us, the closest it would be the scientific associations, which then gives them the feeling that they are actually helping their individual patients. And when we go down to the roles of the physicians, what we're trying to tell them is that we are trying to, first of all, explain that this is part of the medical profession. You cannot say this is not your role, this has nothing to do with you, this definitely has to do with you. But we also are trying to tell them that if they can identify the social and cultural risk factors, they will be able to better treat their patients and they will see better results. And what we try to do is give them, provide them with the evidence. And we know that there has been different interventions in different areas of Israel with different, uh, um, uh, working with different communities. And then we try to publish this information and say, look at why, how this can help you. So, w for instance, we can say, okay, you're treating diabetes, but not all patients are equal. Some patients will understand what you're saying straight off. Some need um, guidance. Some need uh, written material. Some would like you to have to have another member of the family to come in. Each one needs to do, be addressed in a different way. So, um, as I said, I'm... I'm, I'm they're telling me that I'm finished. I thought I had a longer time. Anyway. So as I said, was um, what we did was in our last collective bargaining agreement, we just said that we're going to allocate some of the money in order to entice uh, physicians in order to go into different areas. We also thought that some of the professions, uh, some of the, the, the specialties need to be reinforced, and then again, that's where we put our money. So um, if I want to say where we are today, I would say that in Israel you do talk about inequality. It is on ev it's not on everybody, but it's on the agenda. I think our main challenge that we are finding has to do with 
the grassroots with our physicians in the office who still say, okay, we understand why this has to be at the advocacy level. We understand why this has to be at the policy level. But we still don't understand why we have to or what can we actually do in order to help that. So um, I just want to finish and say that when we try to tell them, one thing that I like to say is I'm always reminded that logic can bring us from A to B, but imagination will bring us anywhere. So I say try to imagine a world where you can provide the best care to your patient, but your patient will all benefit equally from it. And I think that then they usually try, to, they're on board at least for that time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. Very interesting bringing in the, uh, the concept of professionalism, the, the notion of civic professionalism, I suppose, uh, to the equation. We have a time for a couple of questions before we break for lunch. I see everybody's bellies are rumbling. Let's take a question here. Microphone's on its way. Uh, hello, I'm Elsa Vettikis in Sweden. Uh, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, especially the last part there. It was, uh, I have experienced exactly the same thing. I've been working for, for 13 years, but for the last 10 years. And, and uh, it's easy on the higher up level. Once we get down to the floor, it's not as easy to get you through. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about that in Sweden. And what we've been thinking about is structures. Because the, it's kind of a threat. Everyone has been talking about the overwhelming amount of things that you're supposed to do in that one consultation. And that it's a lot of, uh, especially in primary care, a lot of pressure going on everywhere. Um, so, on a doctor's perspective, in the traditional way of seeing it, we, our tradition has been to to, uh, to treat and possibly secondary prevention is what we've been doing. And to get the primary prevention, also this CDH, uh, this, this more wider concept of, of society and so forth into the clinic, I've been thinking a lot about structures. Uh, where can we actually fit this into our everyday consultation the way we live today? And I think the answer is actually no, the way it is in Sweden. Of course, we can get the, always have it in the back of our heads, you know, always think about it, always be considerate. But if we really want to go down and work with it, maybe we should need new structures. Uh, for instance, well, using the, the health and maternity wards better and so forth, or the, the, the child care the school health and all those structures where it's kind of on the agenda, uh, it's always been on the agenda. And if we can improve them you know, as medical associations, enhance their work and so forth, and have new agendas with, with uh, health checkup and so forth that we really can reach the most needy. Um, have you done any kind of work like that? Or have thoughts in that direction? Thank you very much. Um, well, we, we have constant thoughts, and, and what I'm hearing from you is what we hear, the same thing in Israel, doctors saying, well, that's very nice, but when we have seven minutes, we're talking about primary care physicians, if we have seven minutes to treat a patient, um, we're not going to be able to get very much into the social uh, or, or risk factors and so on. Um, I do think we need uh, different structures, and we do know that there are some different structures going on in some uh, health um, in, in some healthcare services, uh, they're, they're just pilots, so I don't know what's going to happen with them. So I don't want to, you know, say if it's good or bad. But one thing I do think that we can all do together as medical associations, I think we can advocate um, for time for physicians um, that that should not be the same between the different patients. I think that in some situations, you patients that are um, more at risk would definitely benefit more from from extended uh, time with a physician. So I think maybe that is a one way that we can do. We can identify different aspects and then advocate to the employers or, or to the government and say we need different time for different patients. Exactly. That's bringing up on the agenda as well. Thank you. Other questions? Right here. I'm Imit from Denmark. Um, thank you for some excellent presentations. Um, I have a couple of questions. The, the one about cultural competency training, if you can expand a little bit on that, that, that is a little bit vague for me, what, what, what exactly you mean with that, because I think both uh, presentations were a lot about 
uh, how you can involve uh, all physicians while at the same time being aware that you need to collaborate across the, the different departments that deal with, amongst other, social inequality. So, so this cultural competency training, could you expand a little bit on that? Yes, if it's okay, I have two slides. I just want to show them to you so, so it will be easier. <coughs> First of all, we are fortunate that we have physicians from um, every, dis it's a, nearly from every culture. So we, we have uh, physicians that are coming from or came from the former U.S. country, uh, Russia countries. And there, you know, so they, that's one type of culture. And then we have physicians coming, we have a lot of physicians coming from or learning in areas so we could have from the Druze or from Arabs or from, um, you know, we were even having some Ethiopian uh, physicians so they can relate to it. But basically, if you can see, and I'm sorry it's in Hebrew, I just didn't have, I wasn't able to translate it. Um, these are actually uh, short videos which the government has produced, the health ministry, and, and which, um, we encourage physicians to watch. So you can see in the first slide, of, of the first one over here, we have a problem that many of our patients want to, before they, they are willing to any treatment, they want to have uh, some uh, spiritual guidance. It, it can be a rabbi, it can be an imam, whoever it is. And, and it's a problem for a physician because they say, okay, we have to go in and, and, and give you the treatment immediately a cesarean or whatever, we can't wait for you to call up your spiritual leader and ask them what to do. So we, we're trying to explain, you know, that you have to be more understanding of what it is. Then we have, we can have a question of, let's say, if you look over there, of modesty, where that might be a problem. I mean, the physician might say, you know, um, you know, take everything off or whatever, and, and we're trying to explain that they have their, in, that they have their, their issues and try to work around it and what can you do in one way or another. Um, we have also, we can have a gender issue where, where you can have a woman coming in with a husband and the husband wants to be there and he's answering the questions and our physicians don't really like that because they say, well, we're sorry, we talk, we're talking to her and, you know, being a woman, I understand the physician more than I would, would like to, but we're trying to explain to them that these are some of the problems and you have to be sensitive, you have to see what, a, what out of that you can accommodate and what you cannot accommodate. Uh, we have, uh, um, you know, we're trying to explain that some people, if you come and you are um, on a very low poverty line, you might be looking at things differently. So maybe you shouldn't uh, suggest all kinds of things which they definitely cannot do, uh, which is only going to frustrate your patient and so on. Um, and then, of course, we can have a problem that you have to work through an interpreter, which is also not an easy thing for a physician. Um, so even if you do have an interpreter there, how do you work with it? So this is just some of the, of the ideas that we have out there. Thank you very much. I think similar problems are encountered in almost all countries, especially with patient mobility and doctor mobility. If we can take one more question, if there is one. I think cultural competency training, you know, if I may interject, is, is really a very practical thing that physicians and their organizations can do. And in Canada, that's happening in the Northwest Territories where the government of the Northwest Territories and the Northwest Territories Medical Association are partnering uh, to, uh, to uh, embark on a cultural competency training um, for, for physicians as they uh, care for the, uh, the uh, Inuit folks uh, who live in the north. And of course, the Northwest Territories stretches nearly to the North Pole, uh, so it's a big area. Final question? All right, well, we'll, uh, we'll break for lunch. I'll remind you that um, we have a lunchtime panel discussion on lessons learned from working with vulnerable populations starting, uh, we hope, promptly at 1.35. So it's 1.11 now. We're hoping to start that at 1.35 here in the Great Hall. So we'll see you back then. In medical practice, so this is a really interesting session. So our first um, speaker today is uh, Associate Professor Brian Owler. Um, he's an Australian trained neurosurgeon and the current president of the Australian Medical Association. He has a keen interest in um, health advocacy and is um, a passionate um, around the health of Indigenous people in Australia. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so uh, yesterday we talked about a range of issues around Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and 
um, some of the challenges, particularly around the issues of the concepts of health, what health means to Indigenous people, so around social and emotional well-being, addressing some of the underlying issues that uh, I think are barriers to progressing um, uh, with the strategies to close the gap and the way that we need to recognise Indigenous people to make them, I guess, an integral part of our, our nation. Now, this is the typical thing that you think about when you think about Indigenous Australians, an outback um, uh, picture, often in seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Um, but I thought we'd spend some time talking about the population itself. It's, it's a very young population. So if you compare the, the, the pyramid of the indigenous population with lots of young people compared to the straight up and down non-indigenous population graph that, um, that really characterizes many, I guess, um, uh, modern populations. The, the distribution of Indigenous people is quite interesting. I mean, we have that concept that they're in remote communities, but actually Indigenous people are really very spread out. And in Australia, this is really a challenge. When I was president of the AMA in New South Wales, which is the largest uh, of the state and territories with the largest population, I had to keep reminding people that actually the problems of Indigenous health weren't the problems of the Northern Territory or Western Australia. They were the problems of New South Wales and in fact every state and territory because New South Wales actually had the largest number of Indigenous people. Uh, but it's still only around the sort of 2 to 3 percent mark. If you go to the Northern Territory though, the figure jumps up to, to close to 26 percent. And this slide though also illustrates another problem that we have where we actually don't know the Indigenous status of many people. It's a real problem with data collection and there are there are obviously issues that get wrapped up in that, but I think if we're serious about trying to close the gap and address this advantage, we have to get better data and understand who is Indigenous and who's not, and that's not always um, obvious. So this is the distribution, and you can see the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, orange, which is around the southeast and a little bit across near Perth, uh, is where the, the majority of the population is based uh, in Australia. There's obviously a, a vast interior which is, um, I won't say empty, but there's pretty sparse distances or long distances between um, towns and uh, populations. So I remember going from Alice Springs, which is right in the centre, up to Tennant Creek to do a, a clinic one day, and it was a 500 kilometre drive just to get to the Tennant Creek Hospital to do an orthopaedic clinic. Um, so, but you can see each of those dots represents about 100 Indigenous people. And so you've got that um, really very much spread out uh, population. But there are a lot of Indigenous people that are still in metropolitan areas and often along the coastal uh, towns as well. When you look at the, the distribution, the majority are actually in, um, in well, a fair proportion at least are in uh, the major cities. Uh, but about a quarter are in remote or very remote areas of Australia, and that represents, I think, part of the challenge, and this session is about some of the challenges and lessons. So when you're talking about delivering Indigenous health care, obviously access and actually getting uh, to Indigenous people is a real issue. It uh, often involves people flying around in aircraft all over the Northern Territory. Um, that's a real safety issue as well, but the cost is obviously enormous. It's about, when we're touring around um, a little while back, a couple of years ago, doing some work for the government, the Northern Territory government were complaining that the cost for delivering health care in the Northern Territory was about five times the cost uh, per head of population as it was to deliver health care in another uh, state and territory. And that's because of the distances that are involved. So that's up in um, flying over Darwin out to um, going out to the Tiwi Islands, which is uh, uh, another or relatively remote Indigenous community, obviously can only access it uh, by aircraft. And there's uh, Anne, uh, our Secretary General, and also uh, Adrian Rollins, who's one of our journalists in-house at the AMA. And uh, sitting just with a shirt sleeve there is actually Dan Harrison, who's uh, um, one of the uh, health editors for the Age and Sydney Morning Herald, two of the major papers in uh, Australia. is actually part of the Canberra Press Gallery. And the, the reason I put that in will become uh, obvious towards the end of the, the talk. 
we actually paid for um, the journalists to come with us when we were going out to some of the Indigenous communities to highlight some of the issues around um, the problems. Now, this is obviously a um, child being checked up by a, a presumably a doctor in a healthcare centre. But the, the, the problem is, how do you actually get people to access healthcare? And that's, that's re a real issue. And a lot of it comes back to uh, cultural um, training and sensitivity. And I think Chris mentioned a little bit about that before, the importance of actually making it accessible. It's, it's not good enough just to put a clinic in a sort of standard way that we would put a clinic um, in the Metropolitan Centre because Indigenous people are very suspicious. Um, they won't actually attend those sorts of clinics. So this picture is put up um, to really illustrate a, a, a point about that. The most important element of this picture is not um, the doctor or presumably the nurse or patient. It, it's actually the wall. It's actually the Indigenous artwork that's on the wall. It's about making it a culturally safe place for people to access. And so that's part of setting up these sorts of centres. There are all sorts of cultural issues that you have to um, uh, address. And, and many of these communities are quite small. So, of course, people have privacy issues uh, when they turn up to clinics. Men and women actually want to be um, uh, separated, often in terms of their waiting rooms, because they don't actually want each other to actually um, know who's attending the doctor because, as I said, they're living obviously in very small remote communities and uh, there's not many people and so if someone's been at the doctor, there's all sorts of questions why that might be. So that's part of providing the sort of, I guess, uh, culturally specific uh, uh, solutions to these sorts of problems. But it's also about the way that you deal with people and so most of our universities now do have cultural training and when I went through medicine, there was none of that. And then I was sent out to Alice Springs to do three months of surgical training and um, that was a real eye-opener. Um, but everyone that went through there, of course, had to have some cultural training. It's about how you try and get information and history from a patient, how you actually interact with them. And it's very, very different interacting with an Indigenous patient, particularly young women, compared to interacting with someone in a metropolitan setting. Uh, because often very shy, often very suspicious, they don't like making eye contact. And so you have to sort of work up and have a conversation. Um, it's not a short consultation. You have to sort of work around the issue and circle around to finally uh, get to the, the problem at hand. Aboriginal uh, people obviously delivering um, the healthcare services is very important as well. So the AMA is very proud to have Indigenous scholarships to try and encourage doctors to um, uh, Aboriginal uh, medical students to complete their training and become doctors and hopefully go back and work in those Indigenous communities and be quite successful in doing that. We still need more. Um, but there are roles for obviously nurses but also for Aboriginal uh, healthcare workers as well. So that's a certificate type course. It's a relatively short course. It's obviously not uh, anywhere near the level of nursing but they're still very important part of the workforce. And you can see there's lots of information about food and um, nutrition that's um, there for intervention as well. This is uh, Amungana, one of the um, uh, indigenous uh, communities just outside of Alice Springs. Uh, the gentleman there is this guy called John Boffer, who's a GP, who I think is probably one of the most passionate people I've ever met about indigenous health. He's worked there for about 30 years. Uh, Anne and I and Adrian, actually, when we're up, up there in, uh, in Alice Springs, we, we had a lecture once and we, we thought the lecture might go for half an hour or an hour. Three hours later, we finally said we, we probably need to, to wrap it up and said, I haven't, I've still got about 50 slides to go. So he's a, just an you know, intense person. You really need those sorts of people to, to um, educate others. But that young lady was a young member of that uh, Indigenous community and she was actually working in the uh, healthcare centre and she was partway through her training to become an Aboriginal uh, health worker. And so I think there's, uh, um, I can't recall who, who made the point earlier, but I think it was David actually who, who mentioned that actually having those people as part of uh, the community uh, investing in those sort of healthcare services delivers back to the community in other ways as well through employment and economics. And, 
it's a really important part of not only delivering the health care service but actually promoting it as well. Um, this is, again, in Alice Springs. This is out the back of the men's health clinic. So there's a separate men's health clinic in town. You can see there's a punching bag and a, there was a sort of makeshift gym um, and a, that car there which is sort of painted out in the typical indigenous um, red, black and yellow colours. Uh, and that was a car that young people had actually been working on in that um, uh, men's health centre. So, again, it's about that, that sort of uh, cultural culturally safe and sensitive uh, area where they actually feel like they can come and talk to people, they can come and talk to, to people that they, they trust. And uh, um, the two, two fellas either side of me, you can see one's got a stock whip there. He's you know, worked in the bush for many years. It's actually a dab hand, I can say, at that stock whip as well. But they would take young men out uh, camping with them and they would talk about issues of domestic violence and about how you treat other members of the community, about alcohol and drugs. And I think that's a really important part of, um, uh, of the cultural um, uh, uh, part of this solution as well. It's actually getting Indigenous people, particularly the elders uh, and senior people in the communities, to impart that knowledge. That's what used to happen in Indigenous communities. And those, a lot of those links have been broken. So it's actually about trying to restore some of those links. So most of the um, healthcare services, um, whether it's in remote uh, or in metropolitan areas, are delivered to, through two uh, major ways when it comes to primary care at least. So the first is through the mainstream health services. So there are many mainstream GPs that obviously look after Indigenous people. and um, um, But the other aspect is Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services or Aboriginal Medical Services. And these were actually originally set up back in the 1960s, uh, originally in Redfern, uh, near the inner city of, uh, inner part of Sydney. Um, but there are now over 150 different uh, Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services and they're under this uh, umbrella of NACHO. And so they're actually owned and run by the local community. Um, they have their local boards, um, they employ GPs, but again, it's about actually that idea of self-determination and they are very, very focused on making sure that they uh, deliver, obviously, health care in a, in a culturally appropriate way. You still need all of the other things as well. You still, unfortunately, need to have people that are going to fly in and fly out. Obviously, eye health is a very important part of Indigenous health care as well. Um, so you still need those people that have come and do those specialist services, which makes it very expensive to provide those services in rural and, and um, um, in some remote areas. I think the biggest thing, though, is having uh, committed people. That um, fellow standing with me is uh, one of the doctors. Um, that's actually the, up on the Tiwi Islands, on Bathurst Island, just north of Darwin. And uh, that young doctor had committed his life, essentially, to working in Indigenous communities. You know, he loved the lifestyle of working in those areas, uh, making a real difference, and I think that's the sort of thing uh, that you need to encourage, and that's really what this sort of stuff, um, uh, successful outcomes, relies on. But it's not just about delivering the healthcare services. You need all of the things running in parallel, particularly around public health issues. Alcohol and drug use are a major issue in... Um, uh, remote areas um, in remote communities and rural communities. Um, grog is actually a term for alcohol and it's a, I think a, quite an Australian term. But uh, many of the communities have actually made the decision that they will be dry and so it's really important to do those things. But this photo just is about the pride that you can give people when they feel like they've um, They've got themselves a home, they've got themselves a job, and I think that's a really impart, important part of health. And finally, particularly these days when I think it's very easy for governments, but particularly the general population to get fatigued, it's really important to keep the messages up. And that's an important role for the National Medical Association, not just in highlighting the problems, but actually uh, celebrating the successes as well. And that's one of the important reasons I mentioned Dan and Adrian. 
is to get those messages out. And I think that's something that the AMA has certainly tried to do. Thank you. I am not an expert in technical things at all. Um, so our next speaker will be Dr. Anna Reed. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Reed is a um, family physician and emergency room physician that has spent about 30 years working in rural and remote Canada, so both in British Columbia and now in the Northwest Territories. Uh, through much of this work, she's been working with Canadian Aboriginal people so uh, and is very passionate about um, doing something to close the gap between um, Aboriginal Canadians and other Canadians. So, Agreed. Well, thank you very much, Jenny, and I'd like to thank Sir Michael and uh, also the CMA for actually hauling me back out of the common burial ground where we send uh, the expired uh, past CMA presidents to die, and we're all dying to get back up and get on a soapbox, so I'm so glad I'm here today, and thank you so much. So um, I work in northern Canada, and I've spent 30 years working primarily with Aboriginal communities, and that includes uh, uh, what we call First Nations communities, which uh, also used to be known as Indian communities, and also uh, Inuit uh, communities, and the old term for that uh, that you might uh, recognize as uh, Eskimo. And I'd have to say, though, after almost 30 years, I'm only just now beginning to really understand the true root causes of the poor health outcomes of Aboriginal people. So, um, 2012 data about Aboriginal people in Canada show that they have um, uh, 26 times the tuberculosis rate of the rest of non-Aboriginal Canada. The type 2 diabetes rate is four times that of the rest of the population. And violence against Aboriginal women is three and a half times that against uh, non-Aboriginal people. So I'd like to talk, though, about one particular issue that stares me in the face every day and every night in my emergency room. And it really is something we haven't talked about that much. And it really is the issue of mental health and addictions. And it's a very big problem in northern Canada where I work. Now, the suicide rate amongst the Inuit people in Canada is 11 times the national average. And in some First Nations communities, it is several hundred times the national average. And yet, in some other uh, First Nations communities, the suicide rate is effectively zero. So I want to talk a little bit about why that is. In my town, homelessness, as you see at the top of this picture, is a huge problem. Now, I live in a community called Yellowknife. We're up near the Arctic Circle. And it's common in the winter for to have several weeks in a row of minus 40 degrees weather. And yet, we have a very large uh, homeless population, which has developed as a result of uh, the cultural collapse of our Aboriginal peoples. And uh, you w would be ashamed to hear, and I am as a Canadian, that up until five years ago, we did not have a day shelter in our community for homeless people, only nighttime shelters. So you can imagine the lives they were living. So to understand um, Canadian Aboriginal health outcomes, you have to understand uh, something called the Indian Act of Canada from 1879. And this was, uh, um, uh, this was an act uh, in Canada that put into place policies of um, displacement of people from their lands and that of assimilation. And these policies went on from about 1800 up until about 1970. And it really caused the genocide of many of our Aboriginal peoples. And this really is genocide as per the United Nations uh, definition of the word. So people were removed from the land, and actually Indians were um, starved uh, purposely off uh, much of uh, Canadian land to, uh, uh, to actually build the uh, National Railway that linked our coast to coast. Treaties were signed but were not honored. Um, it was actually outlawed to have any cultural gatherings or practices. And then, uh, most importantly, I think, uh, we actually removed all of our Aboriginal children into residential schools. And this went on over 120 years and just actually ended about 20 years ago. And so the, the residential schools were run by uh, three different uh, uh, Christian churches of different denominations, but they were um, put into place by the government. 
So um, the narrative really was about civilizing the vanishing race. And uh, in these residential schools, culture was literally beating, beaten out of the children. If they actually played any Aboriginal games, uh, they were punished. Um, it really was a quiet, unostentatious ethnic cleansing. And in some schools, 50% of children, one in two children, died as a result of disease, neglect, and abuse. And in the 1940s and 50s, the Canadian government actually ran nutritional experiments on Aboriginal people in the residential schools. And they actually withheld food to actually study the effects of malnutrition on the population. And so these are the uh, causes of the cultural collapse and the intergenerational trauma to Aboriginal people in Canada that has led to the terrible health inequities we have now. So Canada really has had to look itself squarely in the mirror over the last few years. And it really has been a very painful process uh, for us. And it's been painful for me, actually, as a, as a, a colonizer of Canada. And we're really just beginning, and much of our population, our politicians, still deny what is going on. So really, instead of being this mythical country of tolerance, acceptance, and multiculturalism, we actually have had to face our dirty little secret. And our dirty little secret is that we have had deeply racist uh, policies against our Aboriginal people that have led to the health outcomes we have now. And so we, several years ago, actually had our own Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada. And we, it was to stu uh, study the residential school legacy. And abuse was rampant in the, the um, uh, residential schools. And emotional abuse was across the board, uh, uh, taking away of, of the culture. Um, but physical and sexual abuse was also rampant. And silence was the uh, name of the game, and you were not allowed to talk about anything. So when we had the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission, many of these uh, Aboriginal people, um, it was the first time they'd ever spoken to anyone, including in their family, about the abuse they went through. And finally, families started to understand the multi-generational trauma that happened that led to where they are now. So it's actually little known that actually South Africa based much of its apartheid system on Canadian policies of separation and assimilation. And so South Africa actually came several times after the Boer War to Canada to actually study the system by which our Indian peoples were controlled and managed separately from the politically dominant white population. Now this is a... Um, a very common sight for me in my emergency room, and this is a thoracotomy scar from someone who's had tuberculosis. And when I see this on an Inuit or a Dene elder, um, I actually know a lot about this person's life. I can tell you what actually happened to them, and I can actually predict what happened to their family as a result of them having been diagnosed uh, uh, with tuberculosis because they were removed from the community. And it's led to this concept of social suffering that is key to understanding Aboriginal health in Canada. And social su uh, suffering is really an outcome of policy choices that traumatize at an entire population level. And so children were um, examined uh, for evidence of TB, and they were sent south to sanatoriums, uh, sanatoria, I guess is the right word, um, uh, in southern Canada um, to actually be tr uh, treated for tuberculosis. Um, this, to me, is one of the most poignant images of uh, Inuit uh, history um, in Canada, and this is called the C.D. Howe ship. And this was the tuberculosis ship that, uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s, traveled Canadian waters in the Arctic waters in the summertime. And uh, this would be an Inuit family. They were nomadic, and the ship would arrive. They had never seen a ship like this before, and they were invited to go on board. They didn't know what the ship was about. And so they were examined and chest x-rays were taken. And if they were deemed to probably have tuberculosis, they were not allowed to leave the ship to collect their belongings and they were not allowed to say goodbye to their family. And when the men came back from caribou hunting, they would arrive back and find empty tents and all the elders, women, and children would be gone and they never, ever knew where they went to. So they would be sent south. Uh, one in three people in the 50s had, uh, one in three Inuit people had tuberculosis. And all through the 50s and 60s, uh, 
one in seven um, Inuits was in southern Canada being treated in sanatoria. So this led to a huge collapse of the society. Now, the old term for tuberculosis is consumption, but I would like to think of it not just as consumption of the lungs and the body, but it, this really was consumption of a culture, consumption of entire communities. So that's the bad news. What's the good news? Aboriginal people are very connected to the land in Canada, just as Brian talked about in Australia, and so everything is about the land, and it's not just the... the um, uh, gathering their food. It's about their whole spiritual and cultural connection. And this is the Mackenzie River in northern Canada. And so what we've learned actually, and this has been well studied, that if we actually take troubled Aboriginal youth and we put them back on the land uh, to spend time with the elders doing traditional things and learning about their culture, they actually uh, do much better in terms of their health outcomes, in particular with mental health and addictions. And so um, the, the other part of that is for them to really understand uh, a, a lot of their other cultural practices. And so these are several uh, generations of Dene drummers in the community I live in. And I put this up because I want to tell a short story about a community in, called Alkali Lake in British Columbia near where I worked at the beginning of my career. And in this community, 95% of the people had uh, problems of quite severe alcohol abuse, so a, a huge number. So the community decided to use um, both cultural and spiritual methods of healing to deal with this problem rather than our, our uh, traditional ways of dealing with this. And so the guiding uh, uh, philosophy of the treatment program is that culture is treatment and all healing is spiritual. And they managed to reduce their alcoholism rate from 95% to 5% over just 10 years by this method of treatment. So it's really important for us to understand that the revitalization and recovery of Aboriginal cultures, traditions, and ways of knowing can have profound restorative impacts on health and well-being at both the individual and the community levels. And so in Yellowknife, where I live, there's actually now being offered university courses for young um, uh, Aboriginal students where the elders actually take them out to, on the land to teach them uh, cultural, traditional ways of harvesting. But they also teach them about um, the history of their people, the policies of the Canadian government that led to them being where they are now. And these are the new leaders that are actually going to lead us forward to better Aboriginal health. I don't think it's going to be the physicians like myself, but it's going to be these are the young people that are going to do it. So what are our lessons learned? I think I've probably run over time, but uh, lessons learned. So understanding social suffering is really key if we're going to understand Aboriginal health outcomes. We need, as individuals and as medical associations, to have advocacy against policies that are frankly racist. And our Prime Minister did uh, apologize for a residential school legacy, but at the same time he said that Canada does not have a history of colonization, and he said that Aboriginal issues are not a social phenomenon. And at the same time, he also withdrew Canada's support for the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So uh, the words, I think, are empty. And unless we translate that into actually true belief by our government, we will not move forward on these issues. So we need to learn and teach cultural capability. And again, again this is a whole other topic that's uh, several days' worth of talking that's been alluded to already. We need to really embrace the concept of the medicine wheel, which informs uh, our Aboriginal um, peoples. And, and this is really a holistic view of health that probably all of us should be talking about, quite, whether we're Aboriginal or not. We need to actually incorporate Aboriginal traditional medicines and healing into our communities and our hospitals. We need to actually help um, encourage connection back to the land, to traditional rituals and ceremonies. And we need to really understand that healthy communities mean healthy people. And just one last little example. Um, in British Columbia, there was a seminal study done by Chandler and Lalonde in 1998. And they actually found clear evidence of a relationship between First Nations youth suicide and the community's control in several areas. And these areas were self-government, 
um, land claims, education, health services, cultural facilities, and police and fire services. Now, if a community had control of three of, or more of these um, uh, areas, they actually had substantially less suicide. If they had control of all six of these, they had virtually no suicide in their community. And if they had control of none of these, their suicide r rates were exponentially through the roof. And so we need to really understand this idea of cultural continuity if we're going to do anything about Aboriginal health outcomes. There is more good than bad going on in Canada, and um, I think we have learned a lot, and I think we are now going to be just forging ahead with some of the recent things that have happened. And most importantly, self-determination, and that's uh, about your own government and also about the, the role of um, uh, health uh, design and, and uh, resource uh, use. And so we now have our very own First Nations health community in British Columbia, um, where the responsibility for um, Indigenous health has been handed over from the federal government to the Aboriginal community. Just started two years ago, and we look forward um, to how that's going to turn out. So thank you very much. I know I went over a little bit, uh, but it's hard to shut me up. Yep. <laughs> Thank you much. Uh, that was great, Dr. Reed. So our next speaker is coming to us from New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Mark Peterson is the chair of the New Zealand Medical Association General Practitioner Council. He's been a general practitioner in the Hawke's Bay area for 25 years, and he's also the chief medical um, officer of primary care for the local district health board. Um, Dr. Peterson is currently a board member as well of the Royal New Zealand College of General Practice. Turn it over to Dr. Peterson. Thank you. Yes. I'm just taken by some of the, uh, the comparisons between uh, Australia and Canada and, and New Zealand. It's, it really is uh, uh, an issue of colonisation um, everywhere, I guess. Um, but just to begin with, I thought I'd take this down to a local level. So th this is actually uh, uh, some data that's been taken from a very recent study, although the, um, uh, the dates are... Uh, or, or the latest data is from 2010, but actually this uh, uh, was only published earlier this year. And as you can see, the um, all-cause mortality in Hawke's Bay, which is a small area on the east coast with the North Island population of about 150,000, um, we have a significant difference in the age standardised mortality rates between uh, Maori uh, and other uh, and Pacific. And I think. Probably we, we should in some ways uh, uh, take out the Pacific there because the numbers are actually quite small in Hawke's Bay. Uh, but I just draw your attention to the, uh, uh, the significant difference between the red line and the green line. Um, there is good news in that uh, uh, graph, however, that you should look at as well, is that uh, back in 1996 the difference was about double uh, and now it has significantly closed. So the gap has closed. It's something that uh, uh, Michael has shown in a couple of slides on various things, that actually we can make a difference. So in this situation, we have. Um, and this is just looking at uh, the aged years of life lost. Uh, and again, this is Hawke's Bay data, not national data. Uh, but you can see the, the sort of usual uh, pattern of um, the social gradient. Uh, that those in the poorest areas have uh, the most years of life lost um, and uh, uh, substantially different. You know, that's uh, a difference of uh, four times between the, uh, the first quintile, the richest people, and the, and the poorest quintile. So uh, four times as many years of life lost, um, which is defined as years uh, dying before the age of 75 sort of implies that 75 is the, is the average limit, but we might uh, discuss that. Um, and this is uh, the, the same uh, data on years of life lost, um, but comparing Maori uh, and uh, other, which is predominantly European, and again, the, the Pacific, the numbers in Hawke's Bay are relatively small and uh, uh, probably reflected in the sort of uh, the way the graph looks there. Um, but again, uh, the years of life lost, uh, the good news there is, yes, the, the years of life lost are 
Uh, well, the next is two and a half times, or nearly. Um, but the gap's closing again. So the, the, the graphs are coming together. Um, so why has that happened in New Zealand, and why has that happened in Hawke's Bay? Well, I think um, you know, the issues... Uh, one of the differences between Australia and Canada uh, and New Zealand is that we actually had a treaty signed between our uh, indigenous people and the colonisers in 1840. Um, now, probably for the first 100 years, um, that treaty was largely ignored, uh, and there's some interesting debates that go on still about the difference between uh, the English version of the, the treaty and the Maori translation, um, but uh, essentially that set us up for at least in some part uh, uh, a conversation about um, uh, the rights of indigenous people. Now, one of the other things that we do in New Zealand is, is certainly at national level um, there is a, Ma a Maori health strategy uh, and to sort of drill it down to the four uh, important points um, it talks about supporting whanau, hapu, iwi and community development well, uh, three of those words are Maori um, whanau means family uh, family and extended family uh, hapu um, is a bit larger and iwi are the sort of tribal areas and uh, um, in Hawke's Bay there is a, a single tribal area uh, made up of I, I'm, I'm not sure how many hapu uh, uh, probably about 10 or 15, I think. Um, but supporting them at, at, at each of those levels. And we've also supported Maori participation at all levels in the health sector. And this means that um, we now have specific uh, advisors within the ministry. Uh, all district health boards have um, Maori um, relationship boards, Maori advisors within their... Uh, um, their, their team, uh, usually sitting at, at the executive level. And this goes down to uh, Maori health providers, which uh, uh, are funded to, to provide some of that care. And so that ensures effective health service delivery. And it's important that we work across all sectors, and I'll come to that again uh, shortly. So again, one of the things that's mandated uh, by government and by the ministry is for all district health boards and for all prim uh, primary health organisations, uh, somewhat akin to uh, uh, the clinical commissioning groups within the UK, to have formal Maori health plans. Um, and so these are, um, are developed um, by th those organisations uh, in consultation with the uh, their, their Maori partners within the um, within the area, and I think one of the other issues is uh, we have multiple Maori health providers which uh, have contracts that at all sorts of levels within the um, uh, the health system. But this is about providing care by Maori for Maori, and I think. We don't do that necessarily very well, um, but we are at least making attempts to do that. And the issue, of course, is that you know our Maori population within in New Zealand is uh, about 16 or 17 percent of the total population. Um, I think in, if you look at just doctors, uh, the rate uh, I think probably about two percent of uh, uh, New Zealand doctors would identify as being Maori. So there's a significant uh, disparity between the, uh, the number of um, Maori doctors and, and the population. Uh, not so bad within nursing, but still a significant difference. Um, and so we're looking at ways of trying to uh, uh, provide that health care um, in culturally uh, sensitive and culturally appropriate ways. Now, Fonau Aura, again, Maori words, um, uh, whanau meaning family, and ora meaning, I think, everything. Uh, so whanau ora describes um, health funding, which is, well, no, sorry, it's not just health funding. It's, uh, it's interesting, as I say, the, the difference between uh, uh, New Zealand and uh, 
um, Canada or in Australia. And I think, as I say, I think the important part of that is, is probably the treaty. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, Dr. Peterson, for that great presentation. So the last presentation of the panel is a little bit different. Um, we're going to have Associate Professor Isvan Szilard speak to us briefly about his experiences in Hungary with the Roma people. Um, professor uh, Szilard is a professor in public health medicine at the University of Pex in Hungary, um, and he's also closely associated with the International Organization for Migration, which he's been working with since 1996 and he's a key coordinator of migration and minority health projects and training programs at the University of Pax in Hungary. Professor Szilard? Yes, Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I uh, would like uh, to express uh, my thanks uh, for being uh, invited uh, and uh, have the chance uh, to speak uh, about, on the one hand, uh, of uh, largest ethnic minority uh, health conditions uh, in Hungary, uh, but uh, also the endeavors uh, what uh, our university is uh, doing on uh, that field. Uh, also, uh, I would like uh, to say uh, that uh, although uh, I am uh, not representing uh, a medical association, uh, but uh, a medical university, but uh, as uh, yesterday uh, I have mentioned, uh, our uh, university is uh, strongly committed uh, to uh, involve uh, the health determinants as aspect uh, already in the undergraduate schools uh, of the uh, medical uh, students, uh, at least uh, providing them uh, not only the contents, uh, but sensitize them uh, towards uh, this uh, issue. In uh, this uh, 10 minutes, uh, of course, uh, I not, uh, can speak uh, in details uh, of uh, all those uh, aspects uh, what, uh, regarding the uh, Roma health conditions on Hungary uh, are important. Uh, but uh, at least uh, I uh, try to uh, give uh, you some highlights about uh, the conditions, uh, health conditions, and uh, also about uh, our endeavors. Unfortunately, uh, we Hungarians cannot uh, be too much proud uh, that uh, on the head uh, of uh, WHO uh, social determinants uh, program, uh, there is uh, a photo shot in Budapest uh, about uh, Roma children, and I think uh, this photo expresses all what uh, we have to speak about. Uh, it is, uh, first of all, the hopelessness, and also the aloneness, that they are all together, and of course, the conditions uh, that are not conditions uh, about health and healthy lifestyle. When we are speaking about the uh, Roma, uh, they are making up uh, one of the largest uh, ethnic minorities in uh, Europe. Uh, I do not want uh, to go uh, in uh, detail, but uh, altogether uh, there are more than uh, 10 million. Uh, if uh, we are speaking uh, about uh, the exact figures, I have to say, uh, first of all, there are no exact figures. If you are looking uh, at the EU stuff, uh, about uh, the number of uh, Roma uh, people in different uh, EU member states, uh, then uh, there is an official number uh, that is related uh, to the census, then a minimum estimate, a maximum estimate, an average estimate, and of course, uh, if uh, instead uh, of uh, valid data, uh, one can speak about the estimate, uh, this uh, itself expresses uh, the uncertainty of uh, all of uh, the data. Regarding uh, Hungary, uh, when uh, we are uh, speaking about the Hungarian data, you can recognize that uh, even the minimum estimate is far above the uh, official data of the census, uh, but uh, in general, what is uh, accepted? That, uh, Six, seven percent uh, of the Hungarian population uh, are Roma. 
if uh, you are looking at uh, all of uh, the other uh, ethnic minorities uh, in Rome, they are making up, uh, again, the larger of them. The uh, health concerns uh, related to uh, Roma, uh, I have to go again uh, to say what uncertainties are. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, prevent discrimination policy uh, has uh, just the opposite uh, effect. In, not only in Hungary, but uh, in the region, uh, in the, any of the health records, uh, starting uh, from the primary health care uh, up to the national health statistics, one should not include the ethnicity and the nationality. So that's uh, why when uh, we are speaking uh, about figures, they are uh, only samples and researches uh, and not uh, really uh, the figures uh, of the national health statistics. So, but what uh, we are uh, generally agree that the life expectancy at birth is about 15 years shorter than the average Hungarian one, and if uh, we are speaking about the EU average, then uh, it is 20 years shorter. So can you imagine that at the beginning of the birth, a baby has already lost 20 years of their life. Infant mortality is especially high. Some uh, infectious diseases uh, and uh, what is uh, also uh, important that uh, regarding the non-infectious diseases, cardiovascular uh, diseases, uh, type 2 uh, diabetes, the risk factors are already uh, much higher uh, in the Roma communities than in the general Hungarian uh, population. So uh, that's uh, when the uh, EU is speaking uh, about uh, healthy aging by uh, 2020, uh, when we are speaking about Roma, uh, it uh, sounds uh, at, uh, a bit uh, satiric and controversial. If you are looking uh, on the age structure, you can see uh, that uh, practically uh, above 60, it's practically just the minority of the minority uh, who have uh, the chance uh, to uh, have an older age uh, than 60. If uh, we are looking uh, of a uh, forecast uh, of the changes, uh, up to uh, 20, uh, 2021. Uh, so, although uh, the number uh, of the Roma uh, are growing, uh, but uh, the differences uh, remain the same. So, discrimination. I have to say uh, that uh, when uh, EU statistics are speaking uh, about uh, right-based access to the healthcare services and saying that, yes, by the law, they have the access. Uh, and uh, even in Hungary, it's clear uh, that the uh, Roma in Hungary are settled down, and practically 100% of them uh, have uh, on health insurance uh, level uh, right uh, to the uh, healthcare system. But uh, I always uh, ask, yes, access to the healthcare system, but what kind of healthcare system? How the healthcare system is really prepared to cope with those special uh, issues? What Roma has means not only the health in fact, but uh, also all health related cultural rules, context, uh, and so on. When uh, it is uh, about uh, discrimination, I don't think that it is racist. It is just simple that they think when they are entering the surgery, the physician cannot really understand what they are speaking about. So that's why. When we are speaking uh, about uh, health determinants, social health determinants, uh, and train the physicians to focus on this, 
I have to add, especially if it is about the case of people of the underserved groups, ethnic minorities, migrants, it is not enough to be prepared to deal with the social determinants, but also it's important how to, how can I say, sell to them the idea in the meaning, not the language barrier, uh, because uh, Hungarian Roma are speaking Hungarian, but the content of the words is different. Just uh, an example, help itself, for them, going back uh, to the Arabic uh, roots, it's the problem with the family and not the individual. So that's why they are entering the entire family, uh, the surgery, even if uh, the seven-year-old uh, boy is suffering with some uh, complaints. Uh, but uh, the physician is uh, just crazy that uh, what is the noise uh, there? That's uh, again about uh, discrimination. Uh, and then we are speaking about uh, the problem of health literacy, health education, health promotion, that practically Roma community cannot be reached by them. And, for example, when we are speaking about the high infant mortality, in behind it is the high uh, ratio of uh, smokers under the pregnancy. So, uh, I have uh, no time uh, to go and analyze uh, the data, uh, but in general, it is clear that in the background of the uh, low birth rate uh, and uh, the premature uh, birth, mostly it is that Roma pregnant women are still smoking and going back again, health education, uh, health promotion programs at the community level can not reach them because all of them are, how can I say, designed for the majority population and not adapted to their cultural uh, environment. Again, so, such uh, data from uh, Serbia uh, in the differences uh, and uh, what I would like uh, just uh, again to highlight underdeveloped health literacy is a key issue and we have to find the way how to uh, go into the community and at a community level launch the programs. In <coughs> November last year, uh, together uh, with the uh, WHO, uh, we have uh, organized uh, a conference uh, where uh, uh, to amalgamate uh, EU healthy aging and WHO uh, testing health inequalities. Uh, uh, members of uh, 11 uh, countries uh, participated in the, and of course uh, WHO uh, Roma and uh, health aging uh, programs uh, and. Uh, it was uh, concluding uh, into the page uh, declaration of health aging of um, communities. Uh, you can uh, find it uh, on the WH uh, website uh, because it has been adapted. And uh, just uh, a very final uh, word, what uh, we are not working to train from the community person as a so-called uh, community has mentor who in the are already integrated into the community together with the community for the community can maybe more successful implement uh, health promotion strategies than until now most of uh, the end of us were failed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that very interesting presentation, Professor Pilar. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Um, so they, they will be around the back with some microphones. Um, so just raise your hand and someone will come and bring you a microphone.
<coughs> Woody Kahn, Journal of Public Mental Health. I'd like to thank all the speakers, it was illuminating. But I'd like to follow up the, the other end of the telescope. I used to work with asylum seekers in London who were overwhelmingly from small groups of rural communities, Horn of Africa, Middle East. And they had terrible health. And what you said, Dr. Reed, about the losing their connection with the land and the social suffering, the sense of generations of uh, persecution moving from pillar to post, looking at it from the urban area problem, and it's affecting all your countries as well as rural Aboriginal populations, you have a migration into the big cities. How can we better provide for the health of these people who belong to traditional rural communities and find themselves in our mega cities? <laughs> well, um, yeah, and in Canada, we do have a large uh, urban Aboriginal population, and a lot of work has been done, in particular, um, uh, in uh, Toronto around this. But, but I would say that even if you're in an urban area, your connection back to nature and uh, the spiritual aspects of nature is not necessarily lost. It may be in some cities around the world, but. Uh, in certainly in every Canadian city, city, there's quite a lot of green space. And actually, just getting back to something even as small as growing community gardens, uh, those kind of things are a way to connect with the land, even if you don't necessarily own the land. Well, Aboriginal people never own the land, but as long, even though they're not on a specific piece of land. But, but that connection back to anything that's part of the natural world, and then um, uh, ritualizing some of that with the, the ceremonies, traditional ceremonies around that, can be done on a, just a small piece of... Uh, a garden plot in downtown Toronto. So I think there are many ways that that is being done and, and being modeled in our country. From the New Zealand point of view, uh, absolutely true. We, we have large numbers of Maori who have uh, moved to, to urban areas. And it's interesting that uh, a significant number of those uh, uh, still retain their links to uh, their, their, their iwi uh, or their... Um, Marae, which uh, you know, where, they, where their um, ancestors came from, even if they're uh, two and three generations divorced from that, they still see uh, that connection to uh, their traditional uh, marae or, or, or land. I think that, that that group of people is much easier to deal with because they do have that association. And I think that the ones, uh, the, the group of Maori uh, who don't have that uh, are, are a much harder group to deal with uh, but we are doing at least part of that in, in what we describe as urban marae, which are uh, sort of newly formed um, uh, associations uh, of, of Maori people from, from various uh, 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 tribes originally uh, who, who sort of coalesce to create a new one uh, in an urban area. And that's certainly happening uh, probably in Auckland more than anywhere else, but it does happen. Uh, I may uh, add that uh, exactly uh, Irma, sort of the all of uh, the majority of them are uh, living uh, in villages, uh, but uh, practically uh, even the villages uh, they are uh, taking part uh, in a large uh, village uh, where uh, they are uh, forming uh, their uh, own community, uh, including self-governance uh, as well. Uh, in the cities, uh, there are uh, also some uh, so-called uh, segregated districts uh, where uh, they are uh, dominantly uh, Oma people uh, are uh, living. Uh, the Hungarian uh, slang is uh, calling this district Jamboy. Uh, uh, and uh, the problem practically is the same. How to find the way to the community? Uh, because uh, even in the cities, uh, they are forming a community. Um, I'm Dr. Angela Burnett. I'm um, Dr. at Freedom from Torture. We work with survivors of torture in London and also throughout the UK. And I just wanted to just say to the question that um, we also in London have um, what's called the Natural Growth Project, where survivors of torture work with the land, both in gardening, actually at the centre, and also 
food, growing food on allotments. And what I've really noticed is that people who have really struggled to engage with more formal health services actually really benefit from, from that. So I, don't, I, I think you're based in London, so if you're interested to know more um, and anyone else, thank you. Thanks very much, and thanks to the panel. Um, I'm really uh, interested in the various different descriptions uh, that you've given us of ways that community members themselves are working in the in the healthcare uh, systems that are there. Uh, and, and I think it's absolutely the way that certainly we need to go forward. But it's very, very difficult to achieve. I think we need, uh, in, in our circumstances, gypsy traveller people working in all the generic roles and being able to be open about their ethnicity, which unfortunately there are gypsy traveller people working in those roles that are not um, being open about their ethnicity. But also I think we need people into bridging roles uh, between the community and the system navigator roles. Uh, there's two questions. One is how on earth do we persuade uh, the, the, the funders to, to push the money in that direction? Uh, and the second one is how do we actually, uh, I'm going to say, capture young people into this process? Because in our circumstances, uh, um, a scholarship that you would aim at, uh, at another 20-year-old or an 18-year-old, I'm afraid a lot of our community members are not going to be able to access that. And they're actually uh, veering away from education at, at 10 and 11 and 12 years. What can we do to target the eight, nine, ten-year-olds that we need to be really working with now to ensure that they're there in the system a few years from now? Well, I think the, that role of bridging between um, a community and um, particularly in health, mainstream health services is really important. Uh, um, one of the issues for um, Aboriginal people is that they are nomadic and, and they do go, as we call it, walk about. And uh, so one of the roles is actually knowing where people are and where you can find them. And uh, um, it's almost, you know, you don't put out a, an advertisement for a job description for that. You've got to actually demonstrate um, or, or know and identify the particular people. Um, but I think that, that also comes back to, you know, how do you fund these things? And you've got to keep demonstrating the value of these sorts of services and the roles that these sorts of people provide because it's just so easy for governments and politicians and, and, and the general public to become cynical about the funding that they give to this. So you've got to keep demonstrating how it actually works. Uh, the second part of the question, I, I think that is harder, um, but it comes back to you know, getting the, the right staff alive, starting really at before birth um, and, and bringing people up through that process. And then uh, if you really want to identify the, I guess, the, the, some of the older children, it's the role of the elders in the community as well. So making sure that they do have that community around them and that they've got that guidance. So I think that's probably the most important thing. question and then we have to get into the next session. I think it, um, it's me and Jay Williamson from Glasgow. Um, almost as an aside, but a really thought-provoking book that's about the sense of place that people can have, um, which is maybe um, just quite interesting because you, would, you, you kind of tend to think that this is all about displaced people, but it's a bit of an argument that displaced people can actually not seem displaced, but actually are. Um, and it's a book by Alistair McIntosh called Soil and Soul, and it's about the Scottish context. But I've actually got a question for Anna Reid. I felt that you used the phrase intergenerational trauma with purpose. I wonder if you did. And I, I, I wonder, fairly recently in my work, I have found that thinking about trauma-informed practice has been really key to thinking about how health services can be delivered and how clinicians can work with individual patients. And some of the, the really key work in that has come out of British Columbia. Um, there's a great trauma-informed practice, um, practice guide. And I wonder, Anna, was that purposeful? H has your experience been that using a trauma-informed practice approach um, is helpful in clinical work? Oh, it was very much purposeful and actually um, trauma-informed practice. 
don't have time to go into what that is here, but um, basically it's a, a model that uh, we have adopted with our open arms in the Northwest Territories where I work and uh, based on the work coming out of British Columbia. But uh, when I talk about intergenerational trauma, what I'm talking about is the fact that someone uh, several generations back might have gone to residential school. They come out of residential school not knowing whether they're Aboriginal, they're certainly not white. Um, and they don't know who they are, and that leads to a, a breakdown that leads to no parenting skills because they were removed from their parents, and then it goes down generation after generation. And so it is an intergenerational trauma, and um, it's going to take a number of generations, and we have to be realistic before these problems are solved by building um, uh, the culture again, and uh, so a very purposeful thing. I want to thank all of our speakers on the panel, and I will turn it um, back over to Dr. Simpson to do the, the final speaker session. So thank you very much. I hope everyone had a great lunch and uh, enjoyed the panel discussion. Uh, we're going to continue on with session three this afternoon, what physicians and other healthcare professionals can do. We'll be hearing from two more speakers, and then we'll be splitting out into breakout groups, similar to yesterday, uh, to further discuss how physicians can address issues of health equity in their practice. So I'll introduce our uh, first of two speakers this afternoon, uh, Professor Aidan Halligan is Director of Well North, a Public Health England initiative to improve the health of the underprivileged across the north of England. He is Principal of the NHS Staff College for Leadership Development and Chairman of Pathway, a charity that has developed health services for the homeless within the NHS. Professor Halligan, or is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chairman. And, uh, Good afternoon. I have no slides, I'm sorry. I'll, um, I'll just speak um, for 20 minutes, if that's all right. And um, I'm, a, I'm an obstetrician, so I have no reason to be here at all, really. I just sort of wandered in off the street. Um, but I guess the best learning is often by chance, isn't it? And um, uh, it's, it's always a privilege to be in the same room as Sir Michael Marmot, who... who uh, um, Someone told me years ago, the issue isn't to build a new medical school or a new laboratory. It's to design an environment that drives behaviors. So it's all in our minds. Our minds are very, very powerful. And so Michael's great report um, woke a lot of us up. I was Deputy Chief Medical o Officer of, of this country for uh, some years, some years ago. And uh, I never recognized health I inequalities. But we, well, we always talked about it and had lots of papers and very important conferences where people spoke very well. Nothing happened. Because no one actually felt it. And, um, and that included me. And, uh, and then, then Sir Michael's paper became more and more a currency and started to rise, almost like a tide. And what was extraordinary was in a, in, in a democracy as, as incredibly developed as ours here, how health inequalities could be invisible in plain sight. You know, we're all so well-dressed and, and well-fed, got a lovely lunch, and one in ten people today in Manchester won't have a meal in this country. It's incredible. And, and, and it's, it's, it's almost hypocritical that we, in the medical profession, haven't got solidarity with people who are our bread and butter. What we say, what we do, and what we say we do are three different things. That's, that's always been the case. But it's what we do that really, that really counts. So I, 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 um, I set up a charity for the homeless about six years ago, and I didn't do it because I'm a good man. It's because my, my PA said to me, why don't you do something worthwhile with your life? Yeah, it's extraordinary, actually. And, and uh, um, she always, you know, and that was it. And I said, well, what did you have in mind? And she said, why don't you help the homeless? I said, what's wrong with the homeless? 
we said, well, if you've noticed the people who come to our hospital most, that's Houston, just up the road, UCLH, of course, where I was working. And I hardly noticed. 1.3 billion budget, huge, huge budget. And, and, and I learned um, that no moral, no spiritual, or no humanitarian argument ever works on our society unless it's wedded to an economic framework. So you have to love your directors of finance. There's no reason you shouldn't. They've got beating hearts just like us. But you have to make a good business case for them. So I got a health economist to look at our huge hospital to see whether the homeless made an impact. And interestingly, when they did the review, they found that they attended our accident and emergency six times more often than any other group. They were admitted four times as often. They stayed twice as long because they're twice as sick. But their average age of death at that time was 42 years of age in this city. And we didn't see it. And us specialist doctors loved treating them because they were so grateful. But yet they died. Because illness treatment wasn't was only a small fraction of what we needed to do. But the killer in all of this was that our homeless patients in our hospital cost us eight times as much as the non-homeless. And in that moment, the whole health economy decided to get behind because there was money to be made from it. So we did the unthinkable. We brought a primary care doctor and made him a consultant in this huge hospital. That caused a mutiny among the physicians, the consultants, because, you know, primary care is not quite as good as secondary care, as we all know. My wife's a GP, so I can say that. So. But actually, he was extremely good because what primary care does is they move postmodern, they do tri morbidity, they do physical, mental, and substance abuse, all in the one go. And he was extremely good in his numbers. You've got to know your numbers in this business. You've got to know your numbers. So we made him a consultant. That caused the mutiny, but we, they got over that very quickly because fundamentally most doctors are decent. And, uh, and then I brought in the most compassionate nurse we could find, a woman who'd worked with me for many years as a midwife. She just has this ability to love. I know we shouldn't say that in these kinds of comedies, but you know. That's what melts hearts, and it melted hearts in our big hospital. And then we found that even with a wonderfully compassionate nurse and an excellent primary care physician, it, it still didn't get homeless people to change their behaviors, their lifestyles. So we recruited homeless people to work. In answer to your question about co-producing within the community. So we recruited homeless people. That's not as easy as it sounds, and it's not tokenistic. We now have seven in place. The first one we took in had been a prostitute for 15 years. Alcoholic. Most dysfunctional. Fractured. All of these people went through our CRB, which is our credentialing so, so that they're safe within our working environment. It took nine months on average, but it's possible. And they've been extraordinary. That woman, prostitute, has been prostituted for 15 years, was awarded last December the UK Apprentice of the Year in all categories. She's an alcoholic. We didn't go to the pub, but she's extraordinary. That model is spread across the entire country, not because it's been mandated by government, but because physicians and nurses and managers recognize the unmet need. And we set a set of standards against that that people comply against. And we inspect against it with our regulatory bodies. It spread within five years very quickly. Uh, there's such goodness in our community, but at times we, can't, we don't know quite where to start. In the middle of all of this, health inequalities isn't confined just to the homeless. It's invisible within plain sight in our most deprived communities. And the government's recognized that the north of England, there's a huge gap between the north and the south of England. You mentioned 15 years, Professor, from Hungary, um, but it's, it's 19 years between, between Bradford and Guildford. And yet people live within that environment knowing these figures but not actually believing they're true. So some communities have no grannies above the age of 60. Some communities have teenagers that die. Not regularly, but more often than we have ever experienced in our otherwise normal lives. So Michael pointed out to me only a few weeks ago that the riots in London in, in 2011 started in Tottenham Green, which is the lowest 
male life expectancy in the country. There's a huge issue of resilience and, and, and civil stability at the heart of this. It's not just a medical problem, but someone has to own it and someone needs to lead it. And fascinatingly, in this country, only one in six of the population trust their politicians. Nine out of ten trust their doctors. And they expect us to lead in these things, and yet often we're quite risk averse about it. Anyway, I was asked to look at the north, and in particular one site in Aintree, which had, was overwhelmed with accident and emergency problems, particularly around um, alcohol-based problems. And at the time, um, at the time, we uh, were working with local government people who used to ask the most uh, naive questions. And I remember asking this local government person who was seconded into the hospital, where do you think the alcohol-based admissions come from in the local area? And within a week, the police came back with analysis showing 10 streets. 10 streets of this huge area was where most of the alcohol-based admissions were coming. And when I asked how many off-licensed liquor stores were there, we found 37 within 10 streets. When we asked where the cardiac, respiratory, stroke, cancer, liver problems were coming, they were mostly coming from the same 10 areas. What's extraordinary is that we're much too comfortable with our huge data, our big data, thinking that we have confidence about that that's accurate. In fact, we underestimate what we don't know, and that's what became clear for us. We started to look for the invisible, because the invisible were contributing to the premature mortalities that we were looking. So we mix up care with treatment. We think that giving, Ill, giving medical treatment technically is actually the solution to much of what we're seeing, but, but actually a lot of our work is socio-technical. So I was asked by um, Public Health England and by the government to address this in an unorthodox way. And they said, go where no one else goes, say what's unacceptable, and show how it might be done. Specifically, improve the health of the poorest fastest, reduce premature mortality, and reduce worklessness. So worklessness, 60% of our unemployed have a health-related illness. The problem is, that sounds great and, and rhetorically elegant, but when you go into a really deprived area, which is often 10 miles away from a very plush area, or nearer in many cases, and you sit down with the health visitors, these are nurses within the community, and you ask them what the real problems they face are. It takes about 40 minutes for them to even begin to trust you. They say, well, the first thing is debt, financial debt, in at least 70% of cases. Domestic violence, on the rise, 70% of cases. And self-worth. I mean, we can speak up. I'm here without slides, and I'm speaking up, and, you know, all that kind of, kind of stuff. What gives me the confidence to do that? Well, a life of privilege and opportunity. It doesn't mean my IQ is higher than someone who can't do it. And yet in these communities, there are people who don't feel they're worth it. They really don't feel they're worth being looked after and don't have any hope. They have despair. So our job was to make the invisible visible. And we found there was a lot of invisibility out there. But the health service didn't know about it. We went into housing associations, and we asked chief executives of housing associations, of your 30,000 social housing families, do you know their health? And they'd say yes. And they'd tell us that of 4,305 in one area, 100 had cancer, 115 had cardiovascular, 105 had vascular, 97 had a stroke, 45% were binge drinkers, 54% had childhood deprivation, and 6% of people had no heating. And when we asked them what percentage of the 4,305 had no GP registered, we found that at least 12% a jumbo jet in an area within sight of huge hospitals with magnificent budgets weren't registered. And they tended to turn up as late referrals to our A&E. We understood that you had to match patients' emotional needs before you dealt with their medical needs. They want to know how much you care before they want to know how much you know. One of the recommendations from Sir Michael's report was to give agency and control to individuals and communities. Now, everyone reads that and says, well, that's terrific. That's great. But you know, how are you going to do that, actually? 
because power is never given away, it's always taken. This is fomenting revolution. And yet in a civilized democracy, it should be done in a generous and open-hearted way. So that's a very important part for us to do. We need to demedicalize our system. We need to recognize we're spending more in bariatric surgery in this country than we are in the prevention of obesity. We need to tackle the wider determined complexity of the whole health problem. So a lot of our issues are not recognizing the wider determinants. Ryan Milley, who, who's here, I, I think, from Canada, a huge hero of what Ryan has done for years, and, and, and uh, uh, Ryan explained critically that a political leverage in looking at what determines is really important because the illness service contributes a very small percentage to what's actually happening. So a lot of our problems are that we look at health in terms of economies of scale and standardization instead of economies of flow and individuality. Everything is hyper-local, and we must recognize that. We found that two geographical areas one mile apart have a tenfold different use by the local hospital, by the community. So, in that context, we've put a system in place. We've been given money, um, uh, nine million uh, sterling, to go across nine cities across the north of England, as long as they match with a million each. And, um, in fact, to date, 17 cities across the north have signed up for this, with more than we could... And, and it's not all about the money. We're getting volunteers and emerging from this, and the same themes are coming out. And our methodology is as follows. The first thing we do is know our numbers. We do hot spot analysis, because the data we have, the data we have needs to be layered. So we check with the hospitals when we identify the geographical area what its acute use is. So we ask how many patients coming through A&E are registered or not, what their frequency of use is, what their did, did not attend and outpatients are, what their segmentation by cost is, because 5% of our patients account for 65% of our budget. We then know that that's not enough at that stage, because we still can't reach those who aren't on our radar. So we're using a method called familiar strangers. Uh, learned this from Jersey, where they use their postmen to access their elderly uh, people in the community, because they don't have enough doctors to do that. So we're using postmen, policemen, fire officers, refuse collectors, vicars, lollipop ladies, dinner ladies, pharmacists, betting shop managers. All of these people live in their community and they are trusted because they are familiar. Not all of them, but we, we have a method of identifying those who are. And then beyond that, we do what's known as social prescribing, but what that fundamentally is identifying the demand management problem. Our health service is breaking up because demand seems to be going up, but it's going up because we're managing money, which leads to an increase in money, and what our professions are doing is, when they have a problem in front of them, they assess and refer, assess and refer, instead of dealing with the problem in its totality properly in the beginning. That's becoming very, very clear in all that we're doing. There's also a huge care gap in what we're doing between primary care, who's overburdened, and underpaid in all sorts of ways, and huge subspecialization. And in the middle of this, there is a care gap around what Ryan calls upstream medicine. That's an emergent specialism that will, I'm sure, be postmodern very quickly. In the middle of all of this, the secret to making it happen is relentless kindness. We found that with our homeless patients. They put up a white flag if you keep, keep being kind and interested and caring for them. And what we do on top of that is we identify people within the communities who are natural leaders, not the usual people, but people we identify, 20 out of 4,000. And we call them caristas. To Starbucks call their coffee vendors baristas, we call our caristas. And we take them and the familiar strangers with the military and we develop them as a group for their leadership within the community to sustain the care delivery beyond interventions that are brought in by the government. You can, you can train people to lead within their own community and build their resilience. But at the heart of it, the philosopher's stone is relentless kindness. So we recruit people, not on interview, 
but working with them for five weeks to see if they're compassionate and caring and carry risk comfortably and determined and never give up on the people in front of them. We are um, building services around patients, not putting patients around services, and we're evaluating this uh, using economics, resilience within the community, and counting those who move from being invisible to visible. Um, thank you much for listening to me. I think we'll take questions after our next speaker, if, that, uh, if that's all right with everyone, as we did this morning. Um, Aidan referred to uh, uh, a medical leader in Canada, Ryan Miley, who uh, is somebody who walks the talk when it comes to social determinants of health and health equity. You're about to hear from another Canadian physician leader who walks the talk. That's Dr. Gary Block, who's a family physician with St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. He's an assistant professor with the University of Toronto. He co-founded the advocacy group Health Providers Against Poverty, as well as Inner City Health Associates, an organization that oversees physicians working in over 40 homeless service sites across Toronto. You can watch uh, Gary's online videos on YouTube, the most impressive of which, in my opinion, is his TED Talk. That's well worth sharing with your friends and compatriots. Uh, he always grabs attention because he talks about prescribing money. So with that introduction, Gary... I'm not prescribing you money today. Um, I've been trying to decide if it is an honor or not to be the last speaker in a series like this, and I will take it as being so. And the most beautiful thing about it is I have no time limit, which is wonderful. I'm kidding. I will be well, I will be 15 minutes, I promise. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is the development of a program, really a 10-year development of a program, uh, mostly based in Toronto, but also other parts of Ontario and Canada, around the concept of dealing with social disease, really dealing with social determinants of health on the front lines of primary care medicine, of family medicine in our case. Um, and this is very much a response to the challenge that I hear all, I, I've been giving presentations to doctors around dealing with social determinants of health for uh, about a decade now, and the biggest challenge I hear is, it's all well and fine, we get this is an issue, we get this affects health, but this is not our problem, we do not have the skill set to deal with social determinants of health. So what I've set out to do is, uh, is counter that argument, and I hope to kind of lay out a story for you of how we've done that. Uh, I'm obviously only able to give you a very small slice of what we've been doing over 10 years in the next 15 minutes, but hopefully it'll give you a sense of how this has evolved. Uh, and, and this is really where I'm going today. Uh, this is the sort of multimodal approach we've developed on the front lines of family medicine, especially based in my team at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, a centrally coordinated approach to dealing with social determinants of health on the front lines of medicine. But I'm going to take us back a little bit. Uh, the story really starts about 10 years ago, in 2005, when I was called, as well as a number of other health providers, by a notoriously radical anti-poverty group known as the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty. And they asked us to take part in clinics they were setting up, uh, which were part of a big level raising welfare rates advocacy campaign, but these clinics were focused on assessing people on social assistance for something called the Special Diet Allowance, which was an extra supplement to welfare that gave people an extra $250 or up to $250 per month on their welfare checks, on top of the about $500 and change uh, that people routinely received through welfare. And what we realized in sending out into these clinics and looking at the legislation at that time was that we could actually legitimately prescribe every single welfare recipient who walked into the doors of our clinics the full $250 per month supplement based on an evidence-based diagnosis of poverty. So, not surprising, this was seen as somewhat unusual. Uh, the government did not appreciate this particularly, uh, but we managed to keep this going for about six months or so, and in that time saw around 7,000 people and prescribed this uh, $250 a month supplement to them. 
The climax came at the clinic pictured here, which we actually set up on the lawns of the Ontario Provincial Legislature known as Queen's Park, where in the course of an afternoon we assessed and prescribed the supplement for a thousand people living on welfare. Obviously very much tied to higher level political advocacy. So once the campaign died down, because the government changed the legislation, uh, most of the health providers who'd been involved in the campaign faded back into their regular clinical lives. But I was left trying to, really trying to chase that high, right? Trying to grab onto what it was about that that had mobilized health providers so effectively around this. And I think there were two main elements to this. Uh, the first one was this clear tying of, or this clear role definition for frontline health providers in a big level social determinants focused advocacy campaign. And the second one, maybe a little more unusual, was the actual idea, that the, the fact that health providers got really excited about the, their ability to use their skill set as frontline providers to actually treat a social determinant of health. Right, so they felt like they were bringing their skills to the struggle and they actually saw the direct impact of this, right? Which is why I often use the term prescribing income. And that's where that came from. And so what I set out to do, I realized that we weren't gonna mobilize the entire health provider community uh, into perpetuity around these sorts of things. And sort of stepped back and said, what can I take from this campaign, from that you know, in some ways flash in the pan, but an incredibly exciting moment, and how can I use that to build an actual program on treating social determinants of health to challenge that idea that we do not have a skill set to deal with social determinants on the front lines. And so that's really what I'm gonna outline for you in the next 10 minutes or so, is how that program has evolved. So, I started by looking at the most basic encounters that we're engaged in, that typical frontline 10 to 15 minutes uh, patient family doctor encounter and said, what can we do here? How can we reframe that encounter to deal with a social determinant like poverty? And so what we created was this, uh, what's known as a clinical tool on poverty for frontline family doctors and primary care practitioners. Uh, it's very simple. I've put an example of it. Uh, there's one on every table. You'll see it there. It's a color, nice looking four page handout. But what it does is in a way that has been done with things like diabetes and hypertension, it lays out a simple three step approach to dealing with a social disease like poverty. Very briefly, the first step is screening everybody who comes to your office for income. The second step is using the powerful body of evidence that we know links poverty with poor health to uh, inform our risk assessments, like what we uh, like we do with smoking, and we do that uh, as if it's second nature. And the third step is actually training frontline physicians to intervene in very simple ways in their patients' poverty. What do these interventions look like? Well, if we take one from there, which a lot of people find very surprising, but I advocate asking everyone whether they've filled in and mailed in their income tax returns. The impact, well, we take a single mother with two young kids in Ontario earning about $14,000 a year, so certainly below our poverty line, paying about $800 a month in rent just by filling in that income tax form her income nearly doubles. She qualifies for about $13,500 in extra supplements, right? This is a very simple intervention and an incredibly powerful high impact health intervention. So this type of approach has generated a lot of interest over the last uh, seven or eight years. What's happening? Excuse me. Nope. Jumping back and forth. Um, so a huge amount of interest over the last seven or eight years. Uh, it's certainly been picked up by medical associations like the Canadian Medical Association, which has been very interested in this type of approach amongst others. Uh, and it's been replicated in areas across the country. Here's a version that was developed for people in British Columbia, one for Manitoba, a province in the center of Canada, 
a version developed at the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto focused on frontline pediatricians. Uh, versions that were developed for patients. You'll see one of those is a uh, brochure on your tables as well. This one from Ontario, and this one from a community health center in Vancouver. Uh, and again, very much supported by health organizations, especially the Ontario College of Family Physicians, as well as an advocacy organization, Health Providers Against Poverty, which really did grow out of that same special diet campaign. And what I found, I mean, through about five years of heavily pushing that poverty tool, education sessions, really working to kind of shift the conversations about how we can deal with social disease on the front lines of medicine, suddenly doors started to open. And what I'm going to outline for you next, in terms of filling out the rest of that, uh, that wheel that I showed you of our approach to, to social determinants of health, is a range of interventions that have really emerged over the last one and a half to two years, mainly based at the family health team that I work at in St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And just as a very brief uh, overview, we're a family health team in the southeast part of Toronto. We have about 65 family doctors, about 200 health providers, and we serve around 35 to 40,000 patients uh, in our catchment area with some a certain skewing towards people who live at social disadvantage. And there's been strong interest within this team around moving forward with this idea of dealing with social determinants on the front line. So, to complete the wheel here of interventions, I'm going to run through these briefly, I promise, but just to give you a sense of what we've found so far to be possible in this area. All right, so the first one I see is totally foundational, which I've called using data for equity. Um, and what this looks like is that we've been involved in a project in central Toronto to uh, pilot and define a core set of basic sociodemographic data collection questions, which are now being used throughout the health system uh, in central Toronto. So every person who comes into the major hospitals, many of the major family health teams, community health centers, get to ask this basic set of questions. What's unique, uh, I mean, that's unique in itself, but what's unique in our setting at our clinic is that we are actually asking patients to complete this questionnaire on a tablet computer when they walk into our waiting rooms. And by the time they reach my office, the answers to these questions are sitting there on the electronic medical record. So I can directly intervene, if needed, in their social determinants of health, as per the answers to these questions, or at least start to explore them further. So to me, this is absolutely foundational to being able to directly intervene on the front lines. Also, of course, for equity-based program planning, program development, and evaluation moving forward. Really exciting stuff from my perspective. We've also moved to look at what frontline health positions we can create to support us in our attempts to deal with social determinants. And again, we started first with income as a kind of basic foundational social determinant. And what we created was a position called an income security focused health promoter. Uh, and I should say that much to my surprise, we threw in kind of on a whim an application to our Ministry of Health to fund this position as a core part of our health team and they accepted it. So we now have a core permanent position of an income security health promoter. Uh, and in terms of the area she focuses on very briefly, certainly the frontline, uh, very intensive, focused individual income uh, security assessments, which are wonderful. Also working to raise our entire health team's capacity to deal with income security issues. Uh, training us as health providers around interventions that we can carry out. She will never be able to see uh, all 35,000 of our patients. Uh, focusing on patient education, so again, spreading her reach, and devoting some specific time to, to a systemic level advocacy to deal with issues that come up through her work. This is very much supported by a strong research and evaluation program, including a randomized controlled trial as a service that's just getting started up now. We've also looked to what I've called intersectoral partnerships, so attempts to bring in expertise from other sectors to support our work uh, in this area. 
And specifically, what we've done most recently is create a medical legal partnership. This is something that's very familiar in the U.S. and in other areas, not as common in Canada. And I think what's, again, really exciting for us is that the focus of our lawyer, we now have a government-funded lawyer on site, her focus is specifically on the myriad legal needs that face people living at social disadvantage. And again, she's focused on a couple of areas, those intensive, uh, intensive work with our individual patients as things come up, uh, training us as a practice to recognize and identify legal issues, educating our patients around their legal rights again, and again, specific time devoted to higher level advocacy based on the issues that come up through that frontline practice. And again, supported by a strong research and evaluation program. We've also looked to create other networks into the community that we work in as another way of dealing with social determinants on the front lines. And here I'm going to briefly tell you about this project called EMBER, which stands for uh, Employment and Better Employment Through Relationships, really focusing on access to decent work as a social determinant of health. Um, three elements to this. First of all, just an environmental scan of what's going on in our neighborhood around this. Second of all, uh, a little more unusual, is the creation of an advocacy network that really has three heads to it. So the primary healthcare organizations are, are one head, uh, us included, social service agencies that deal specifically uh, with employment and supporting uh, vulnerable populations and accessing decent work, and finally, advocacy organizations that focus on creating decent work environments and, uh, and working with people to know their rights around employment. So we have these three partners around the table uh, creating an advocacy group at a high level. Uh, and the third piece is an actual individual-focused intervention in this area. Again, taking those same three partners and using their unique expertise to deal with individual patients' issues around accessing decent employment. So we're going to run this as a pilot, hopefully for 30 or 40 patients, uh, evaluate it, see what happens with it. So the final piece uh, is what I've called community integration. So this is where we're really trying to start to bring the community's voice, our community's voice, into what we do. And to this end, we've hired a full-time community engagement specialist to support our work. Uh, and she has a couple of roles. Certainly, and probably most importantly, is bringing our community's voice into our program planning and into our program service delivery. Uh, second of all, bringing our voice, the health team's voice, out into the community to increase that two-way communication. And third of all, identifying advocacy initiatives, uh, really, that are, that are brought forward by the community in which we can serve as a partner. So that's it very simple approach to dealing with social determinants on the front lines. I should say, you'll notice that there's a uh, social determinants intervention guiding group in the middle there. We are doing our best to coordinate this, to work with this incredible explosion of programs that we've had with our team, uh, and, and do our best to kind of uh, support this and evaluate this and make this sustainable moving forward. So it really is very much an evolution, but we seem to have hit a kind of tipping point in our ability to deal with the social determinants on the front lines. So I look forward to the discussion and questions. Thank you. All right, I think, I think we'll take a few minutes uh, for uh, a few questions before the breakout session. Yeah. Do you have a mic? Let's, uh, we'll get the mic to you. I'm Karen Midwife, and um, Gary, your, your views on primary care physicians. My research on staff stress suggests that some of the key professionals that change would depend on. In Britain, that's general medical practitioners and social workers. When I raised this at a meeting of community nurses last week, I got ribald laughter because staff stress and low morale are preventing them doing many of the initiatives at a professional level that would implement systemic change. Now, this strikes me as a matter for professional bodies. What can we do that will raise the morale of thousands 
the social workers even more demoralized than the GPs, thousands of very struggling professionals. And we have initiatives in Britain like the Troubled Families Program, 120,000 uh, workless, alcoholic, depressed, violent, uh, not school attending children and families. Uh, and that's exactly the situation where the uh, community staff burn up very quickly, less than a year. How do we address those issues? Yeah, I, I, my, well, my, I recognize what you're saying. Um, we, um, in, the, in, the, in the project we're doing, we take on volunteers. Now, that, that isn't people who aren't paid. They're paid the same rate, but we want them to want to work in this work. Um, my real problem is stopping them working beyond their normal hours. It's extraordinary. I, I, I've, I've never seen such a happy group who seem to be relentless in seeking to make a difference. What, what we do with them is to safe, physically, for an hour, but also to keep them safe in their working environment. Uh, so good leaders keep their teams safe. Uh, that is true, isn't it? Uh, and professional bodies don't always do that. Do that. Because let's be clear, uh, whenever I'm uh, involved with professional bodies, it's all about what people are paid. But I'm not finding that salary is the most critical factor to avoid burnout and demoralization. I'm finding that job satisfaction, empowerment, vocational uh, refreshment, and rediscovering of lost values is at the heart of so many of our professionals. And, and, and to be honest, um, I, we've developed multiple agency teams. So we're very clear that policemen, um, firemen, dietitians, all of these have, have a lens on the same group that we're looking at doctors and nurses. Um, uh, and in fact, we developed multiple disciplinary teams where people's badges are left outside and we encourage mutual respect through well-led teams. Uh, the army has shown, because stress and burnout is often seen as post-traumatic stress, isn't it? I'm sure you agree with that. But all the psychiatric studies are showing that no matter how horrendous a platoon experiences in a war theater, if their leadership is good, the post-traumatic stress is minimized. Why can't we learn that in our profession? It's not just about money. I'm sure you'd accept that. One of these on? There we go. Uh, the, the only piece I would add to that is that uh, I certainly found that one of the biggest contributors to morale amongst any frontline professional is the feeling that we're just not making a difference. We're not able to do anything. So to me, this idea of, uh, of building people's skill sets, including pe building people's teams, so building the support systems around health professionals, is absolutely key to dealing with morale issues. And I've also done a lot of work with the homeless uh, in Toronto, and we've been fairly systematically working to build those types of teams there as well, and have certainly seen just an increase in confidence, I think, amongst frontline providers because of that. Other questions or comments? In the back? Hi, this is a question for Gary. Um, please excuse me if I miss a bit of this. I had to rush out and take an assistant work phone call, I'm afraid, and lost about 10 minutes. Um, it was the point about people filling in information on a tablet when they were coming to see you, which I'm particularly interested in. It's obviously it's a very good sort of live, real-time way of collecting data. A lot of the evaluations I've been doing and working with groups on the margins as issues in our literacy language <coughs> or actually even asking someone else to help complete data for them. So I'm wondering how you're dealing with that. Obviously, you're in a very, you know, it's a very collective, very strong situation. But if this was to be rolled out further, would you have any particular advice? And I also just want to congratulate you on the work. It's absolutely fabulous. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so there's actually a very good multifaceted pilot that was done of the sociodemographic collection tool. It was done in five sites. Every site collected the information in dramatically different ways. So ours on the front lines or other sites that had frontline health workers collecting it. Other sites had reception workers collecting it. Um, and with, with very different populations, including, for instance, a schizophrenia-focused clinic at one of our mental health hospitals. 
So the report from that is, is available. Uh, it, it's certainly available through St. Michael's Hospital website, and it, it is worth looking at the findings there. Uh, th there's no absolute answer to the question. There's no perfect way to collect that data. Uh, you know, we, we continue to do it the way we do it because of our interest in, in being able to intervene in this, uh, in, in these issues on the front lines. We, and, and actually our completion rate for the survey so far has been quite good, uh, in some ways surprisingly good, and even and for each of the sub-questions, uh, quite good. Income is the worst, but even there we're getting over, I think, a 90% completion rate, which is good. The survey is available in like 17 languages, I think, or more. So, uh, but in terms of the absolute literacy question, uh, it, it, it's a challenge, right? We do offer to complete it with people and have support, but yet you have to individualize that to some degree. One more question. I think we have time for one more. If there's any, uh... okay, yes, in the back. Hi, this is directed to Aidan, really. Uh, what on earth can we do? We have been going on for years and years and years now about collecting monitoring data from Gypsy Travellers and Roma in this country, and I appreciate the, the list of other indicators that we also ought to be collecting alongside that. But despite really a, a, a big head of steam, we're, we're not even getting a response from NHS England now about changing the data set for for monitoring for these groups. How on earth can we influence change? Can I ask you a question in return? What would you see as success if you got the purpose? I just wouldn't keep finding myself in a position being told, use the data. I'm not going to exactly quote you. I didn't, I didn't write you down, but keep demonstrating the value. Uh, and, you know, and it's absolutely right. We just find that impossible to do. We've done little case studies, qualitative uh, work, storytelling, all these other methodologies. But when it really comes down to it, the money follows the data. And I think without the data, we're just really struggling to get the money. That's the next thing I thought is the money follows the data. What we're finding is that that isn't entirely true because everyone seems to cite the data for their own purpose. And that suits government at times because they can all say our data is slightly different. What the money follows is what you do. So if you do a pilot that demonstrates beyond any reasonable doubt that an intervention will make a difference to the group you are serving, resistance is futile. As long as you follow through and ensure that you build on it so that they cannot offer a reason not to invest in success. That's what we did with homelessness. And the other thing is, and it's, it's worth um, bearing this in mind, we, uh, we've realized after several years that there's lots of homeless groups in London and across England. Um, if each of us knock on the minister's door one by one and get a half an hour each from six o'clock in the morning till eight o'clock at night, he'll see us one by one. His nightmare would be if ever we got together and all arrived at the one time. And we've just decided to do that. We've just decided to be, up. yeah, we'll, we'll include you, absolutely. And in fact, Nigel Stewart is here, our chief medical officer, and um, it was very much his idea. And, and we will do that and, and let's see what happens. Democracy is a wonderful thing, you just need to, understand which levers to pull. <laughs> well, that, is a, uh, that question and the answer is a great segue into the next uh, part of the afternoon because we're now going to put you to work um, finding some solutions, identifying barriers, identifying facilitators, opportunities uh, that exist to address uh, health equity in our societies. Um, as we did yesterday, I'll ask you to organize yourselves into groups and uh, perhaps today uh, you'll be brave enough to mix it up and find some people from other countries that you haven't met yet and uh, cross-pollinate those ideas and uh, see what kind of fantastic things you can come up with. Uh, toward the end of the afternoon, in about an hour or so, a little bit less than an hour, um, we will um, have each of the groups um, to um, uh, reflect back to us um, in a report. So we'll get you to designate a scribe and designate a spokesperson. Often they'll be the same person. 
And today we'll ask you to address the following questions. <clears throat> I don't know whether we have them to display or not, but the first question is, yes, we do. What are the top actions that healthcare providers can play in tackling inequalities through their role as employers, managers, and commissioners? Second question, at the clinical frontline level, what are the top actions for physicians and other healthcare providers? And then finally, how can your organization provide support for action on the social determinants of health and health equity at the clinical level? So I'll, I'll give you a 10 minute heads up uh, before we're going to ask you to report back, but we're gonna aim for about 4.25 or so, and we'll be serving you coffee and tea to help keep you energized uh, as you're doing your brainstorming work. So best of luck, and we'll look forward to hearing your reports back in an hour or so. We'd like to hear the results of your discussions. Um, yesterday, I believe we started at table one and went to 18. And there aren't 18 tables here today, but who's closest to the highest number? Is there a table 16 or 17 or 18? Maybe at, at the back, Jenny's pointing. Um, let's start there. We'll go group by group. Um, we'll ask each reporter to uh, present a, a succinct uh, summary of, uh, of their high-level feedback. Um, we'll see if you can limit your response, uh, if possible, to the top one or two suggestions per question, uh, just for brevity. But rest assured that uh, all of your booklets will be collected, and so all the great feedback is going to be, uh, um, is going to be saved and, uh, and accumulated. So uh, let's start with the, with the back table. Hello, it's uh, Ryan Miley. I'm a physician from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is in Canada. Um, so we looked at a, a number of different actions that healthcare providers can play in tackling inequalities, uh, recruiting staff from the disadvantaged communities themselves, and disclosing that background, making it really a, a welcoming place for people from the community to participate in the work, as well as to access the services. Uh, commissioning health impact and health equity assessments, presenting the evidence to a variety of audiences, and using, uh, using our ability as healthcare providers to access the media to, to share the stories of social determinants of health. Um, moving towards uh, models that allow for people of various levels within the organization to have their ideas shared, whether they're junior or senior, whether they're uh, recognized leaders or, or people outside of what would traditionally be the hierarchy. Um, I'll, I'll skip a couple more bit just because I don't totally understand your short hand. Um, when we look at the clinical frontline level, there's a few things that would be really helpful. One is making sure that we are actually analyzing the, the data in terms of outcomes in a way that takes into account so first we have to collect data on social status and income and all of the other determinants. And then we need to assess our outcomes based on that and use that to guide the development of clinical practice guidelines so that when someone comes in and we're assessing their blood pressure, for example, whether we treat or at what point we screen is different based on what we know about their income and the risk factor that that turns out to be. And then building on that, uh, the development of useful, easy to use clinical tools that actually lead to intervention. For example, having a tool where uh, it's the, the patient fills out a, a series of questions on determinants of health and that's actually linked to a searchable database of available social services that can help that patient so that you put in the hands of physicians not just questions but actually answers uh, that's going to go a long way to getting people more engaged in, in actually bothering to ask those questions. Um, some of that requires longer time slots, so maybe we need to book in, like we do with an annual physical complete, maybe we need an annual social complete where we spend a little bit more time really digging into somebody's circumstances, taking the time to listen to their full stories, not interrupting them after 17 seconds, as the famous study showed. And then Looking at organizational level, um, I think we were just starting to talk about that, but one of the things that was emerging was within organizations, finding our champion for the social determinants of health, who on our team really cares about this and has the ability to make change, and then looking to 
the organizations we want to partner with, whether in our field or reaching out to government and policymakers, who are the champions that we can find, what are, as, as Aidan says, the levers that we can pull uh, through, through identifying the, the real leaders out there. Thanks very much, Ryan. Fantastic. We're talking about delisting the annual physical exam in Ontario, so maybe they can list a, an annual social instead. Okay, who's the next table? Me. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Bryce. Didn't see um, you. So I'm Bryce Jerfar from uh, Montreal with the Canadian Medical Association. So our group, um, we kind of lumped all three questions together. So um, I'll just give you some of the, the highlights. So we thought that it was most important to sensitize the other members of the team uh, with whom we work and uh, that we really felt that it started with awareness uh, amongst um, all of the team members, and that this in particular starts with the receptionists, because they're the people that actually interact with the patients on, on the true front line, and uh, so the way that they um, interact with the patients is critical. Um, of course, if we have the resources, we'd like to hire uh, all the team members, so social workers, nutritionists, who can address these uh, social determinants better than we can, and uh, or, you know, going all the way to legal advisors, if of course we're able to, that would be fantastic. Um, we thought that again, the fee-for-service model um, it can be a barrier to the team-based approach. Um, some systems now we were hearing uh, bundle fees, so not only just for a procedure, but for pre-op and post-op care as well. And we wondered if we could also bundle in some of the, uh, you know, exploring the social issues um, with those fees. Um, we need uh, we need support for our frontline staff. So we heard it's not it's not necessarily only about uh, the fees that we're being paid, but also about the environment in which we work. And uh, we want to make sure that we don't have uh, good people that are qualified and uh, willing to work, but then end up burning out because they have uh, work conditions that are are not suitable, and that they end up working very long hours. Um, we said that definitely, like was mentioned, uh, screening uh, is critical. The challenge is how do we find a time? So we, we liked the iPad in the waiting room uh, suggestion. Um, we thought maybe it, it means picking three key questions, like what we heard at the end of the month, do you struggle to make ends meet? And just making sure that with every patient we see, we do uh, include a question like that. And uh, again, uh, there's a role for education and exposure, as we discussed at length uh, today and uh, yesterday, but also focusing on recruiting people from varied backgrounds uh, to really get them to uh, train as healthcare professionals and then eventually encourage them to return to practice in the communities where they came from. Um, finally, we said that uh, electronic medical records um, could play a role in uh, having us uh, be able to flag social risks in addition to, um, to medical issues that uh, our systems currently support. So. Excellent. All right, and our next table, the microphone is on its way. Hi, I'm Katie Smith. I'm a public health registrar from the UK. Um, just for a little bit of context, we had a mostly UK-based table with one very welcome Canadian member. Um, so I'm trying to fit our varied discussion into the headings, um, the first of which um, about employers, managers and commissioners. Um, our initial discussion focused quite a lot on co-location of a range of services, um, and particularly we had lots of examples from um, the UK where this had worked successfully, things like um, employment advice, citizens' advice bureaus, um, translation services. Um, lots of these, though, are the voluntary sector provided, and we also recognise that increasingly over recent years, um, political um, policy, um, austerity measures have meant the, the ability for these things to have ongoing provision has been, has been drastically limited. Um, however, it was also raised that perhaps that identifies that as physicians we have a role to ensure the... Um, Sustain sustainability of our voluntary sector and that if we recognise the value of these services, we're also having a role in ensuring that they're able to continue. Um, one of the other things that we focused on was, as has already been mentioned, the importance of data, um, adequate and accurate data collection and data collection with a strategic focus that's looking at process and outcomes rather than just targets. Um, we did talk briefly about legislation and how bringing health inequalities into legislation 
um, and to give regard to health inequalities is the first step. Um, again, our Canadian colleague said that if that's step one, she feels that they're currently at step zero, um, but that we all recognise that it was only part of the way towards uh, making it a, a focus of, of policy. Um, moving on for time's sake to the second question of um, the actions specifically for physicians and healthcare providers. Um, coming back to data, we felt that that places some of the onus back with physicians to ask about the data and ask about our local population and make sure that what we're doing is evidence-based um, and considers the, the full story of the people we're treating. Um, we had a very lengthy discussion about the role of individual physicians in terms of interacting with politicians and getting involved with policy. We had a really good example from Canada of the MP and the is that correct, MP and D scheme that uh, was discussed this morning, and also uh, we were told about the a similar scheme that happened in the UK in the run-up to the 1997 election, um, and the fact that actually giving um, direct contact between individual front care physicians and their local um, politicians was really important. This brought us on to one of the issues of shared patient stories and the fact that we didn't think there was anything more powerful than a physician who has responsibility for the same group of constituents as a politician, being able to talk to them about individual patient cases and, and set the story for how policy is directly impacting people in their population. Um, the final question about organisational support. Um, the very key point was made that actually to bend political will, um, what's often needed is solutions rather than just problems. And so I think there's a real case for organisations to be able to give clear examples. Some of the things we've already talked about, about co-located services, for example, of things that work the evidence base for these and give politicians and policy makers the, the indications of, of what would be good things to introduce and how, how to go about them on a national level where we know they work locally. Um, and the final point that we have, uh, there was a uh, lot of support again on our table for the argument of propor proportionate universalism um, and actually organisations allocating services and resources based on need, as has already been discussed, rather than on per capita um, type systems. There was a little bit of debate about the role of medical associations as well in terms of linking with um, political organisations, and I think that reflected some of the different roles of medical organisations in different countries um, with respect to the appropriateness of political affiliation or political interaction or not, but we certainly felt that this was an important way to go. Thank you. All right, next table. Thank you. I'm Claire from Brussels, and we were at a table with representatives from NMAs from Australia, uh, New Zealand, we had from Belgium, and the UK. And at our table, we decided we would only look at number three. So, because in number three, we actually ended up while discussing number three, as we've heard from all the other tables. You're actually putting lots of um, efforts in actually answering also questions two and one at the same time. So we decided that the local organizations, NMAs, should first of all be able to identify local champions, clinical champions, encourage and support them in every way that they could. And so number one was find them. Number two, how to support them. Exactly what you've been discussing already, so I'll be very fast, give them the information, the necessary data or data, and give them a plan if there is one, help them to work, to work basically around all the information that they can gather, and then um, that's number three, basically, is to then help them by providing them with resources. Now, that point, I think how to find the right money has not been discussed fully, and I'm sure we've all got better ideas on how to provide the full resources, but resources are not just money. We felt that it included helping them, therefore, to find also how best to go about their project, how best to support the champions by, for example, getting, get, get, giving them not only the data, but the possibility to have a working group around them. And that would mean including non-clinical 
support people, as you've always proposed. We really, we really need to have people who might not be necessarily just in this case. We've spoken about having lawyers, we've spoken about having economists, we've spoken about having the people who are locally, who have got all the local knowledge on the ground. Uh, we've we've loved the idea um, of using Toronto, obviously, as a great example, recruiting people who are not necessarily the experts, but who are actually have got the expertise, the local working knowledge. Then we've also spoken that the, about the role of NMAs in terms of dissemination. We feel that once you've got local champions and got a really good project going, you need to be able to organize events around these, to advocate, to, to provide adequate advocacy about this project, and therefore speak directly to the local politicians by through disseminating um, your project, the, the, the local project. And that brings us back to the using the media adequately in order to provide immediate feedback to the politicians and include them, if possible, in your project. Now, number five was really then evaluation. We need to, the NMAs need to be able to help you evaluate the outcome of whatever project you've got going so that you can, in return, give positive feedback to the politicians, to the local helping organizations to really encourage further action and sustainability. Um, we also felt that an NMA, well, could not provide all the expertise and that to provide all the tools, it would be useful to actually think about get, getting back to the W, the World Medical Association and asking them, if possible, to have on their website all the tools that they could gather, local NMAs could send best practices, send best models and share the best practices on a website page of the World Medical Association because of the local NMAs cannot provide you all with all the best answers and they cannot necessarily have all the information about best practices around the world, but the World Medical Association could. And that would raise basically the importance of the World Medical Association. Um, we decided there was no magic formula. Um, we felt really that everybody should really make their own the success stories that we've heard about um, by gaining uh, knowledge and sharing knowledge. Have I missed out a point? Thank you very much. Thank you. And our final table. Good day. I am from the London, Swedish, Trinidad, Tobago, Zambia, Portugal, Trinidad, Tobago team. And for question one, basically what you said is that our roles as employers, managers, and commissioners, the first thing you have to do is that you have to believe that inequalities do exist because we are the leaders. And if we don't believe in this, we cannot encourage our staff or encourage anybody else to believe in it. So the first thing you have to do is believe that inequalities do exist. And then we have to get data. And we get data basically from local areas first, then we build up to national and regional data. Because once we have this data, we could, as one of our colleagues said before, we could move the invisible to the invisible. And we take this data to our money makers, the people who provide us with the money so we could move forward. And as leaders, as employers, as managers, as commissioners, we have to encourage teamwork. So it's basically a multidisciplinary approach. And we have to basically empower at all levels, from medical students to young doctors to the more senior doctors. And we have to get all health professionals involved, from not just doctors, but nurses, um, psychologists, social workers. Everybody has to be involved in tackling inequalities. Question two. Again, at the clinical frontline level, 
the GP should again be interested in knowing and interested in getting information on social determinants of health. And at a conference I went to a few months ago, they said good leaders, the first thing a good leader does is ask great questions. So again, in a clinical frontline level, we have to ask questions. Because if we don't ask questions, we will not get feedback and know what um, level your, your community is at. And then, we have to interact with the important players in the community. So it's not just the GPs involved, it's the religious leaders, it's everybody in the community being involved. And maybe we can do a little pilot project. For example, our colleague here in Sweden said that the GPs and psychiatrists are working together and they're doing pilot projects. Basically, because this could provide the information you could take to the higher authorities. And question three, which is one of our favorites, was how can we provide support? We came up with training, research, helping in the formation of infrastructure, forming alliances, forming networks with other colleagues. It's basically a multi-sectoral approach because, for example, some NMAs, for example, in Portugal, they're also the regulators. So we want those regulators to get in the medical school system, get um, a whole program or a whole course on social determinants of health. In my country, what we do is in our preclinical years, before we go to clinical, the students are required to do a project. So maybe in this third year project, we can encourage them to do a project looking at inequalities and a project looking at social determinants of health. Because the earlier we start them off, the better it will be and we can bridge the gap between school and what's actually happening in a clinical situation. Is that it? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, this has been a really rich, rich day. Rich conversation, great engagement, great ideas from so many different places around the world, lots of sharing. I wanted to, uh, before I hand things over to Sir Michael, um, once again, thank the tweeters. And for those of you who think that I've been overdoing the Twitter thing, um, the Minister of Health in Ontario, population 14 million, has been following our proceedings today. And he says, excellent conversation, hashtag doctors for health equity. We're committed to the work in Ontario, and HealthLinks is just one vehicle to engage providers. HealthLinks is a program aimed at uh, targeting the highest users of the healthcare system. So from this room to the world, uh, and we've caught the attention of a very influential uh, politician in Canada. So never underestimate the power of social media. So I'll turn it over to Sir Michael to uh, uh, wrap the day up, uh, summarize the day's event, and uh, talk about the future. Thank you. And start by just saying thank you again to our Canadian colleagues and my own colleagues at the Institute of Health Equity, BMA, WMA, for making this conference possible. The first thing is just reflect for a moment. Cast your mind back three years, four years. Could you imagine having come to a meeting like this? I can't. Having national medical associations, doctors, leaders come to a meeting to discuss the things we've been discussing. It's quite extraordinary. So the, the fact that it happened at all is the first thing to say, I think, that it's really special. But that is the lowest common denominator. It's been much better than that. It wasn't just that it happened. As you said, it's been a very rich discussion uh, all through the day of the various presentations that we had uh, of how doctors, leaders, and doctors are playing a key role in addressing social disadvantage as it translates into health disadvantage. I'm slightly regretful that our Indian colleagues were not able to make it. Uh, the Indian Medical Association, very conventional medical association, had been working, they took me off to rural Gujarat uh, to show me the work they were doing with the tribal people in this remote area of rural Gujarat started by delivering medical care 
to an un unserved population, but then got involved in developing agriculture, education, teaching crafts, making people economically self-sufficient, changing the whole economic structure of the local population, as well as delivering medical care. And it came from the doctors. So the kinds of things we've been hearing today, uh, I think, could be reproduced in other parts of the world. I was struck when Leah said, logic will get you from A to B, imagination will get you anywhere. And it put me in mind of David Hume, the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher, who said that it's quite logical to prefer the destruction of the world to bruising my finger. That in fact, he says, uh, logic is a slave of the passions. This is one of the great rational philosophers. Logic is a slave of the passions. And I think it relates to what we're doing here. And a question that I was asked when we did an interview at, at lunchtime, uh, why do we tell the stories we tell? And I think we need the passion and we need the logic. We need the evidence. Being a good person is a fine thing, but it's not enough. Good people can do terrible things. Good people can waste their time. Just being good and having good intentions is not enough. We need the logic. We need the evidence of what works, of what will make a difference. But we need the passion. The logic should be the slave of the passions. The, log the passion to make a difference to health, unnecessary health inequalities in the world, to health of the disadvantaged, populations as well as subgroups of populations is absolutely key. And the idea, and again a question that I was asked, was why the doctors? Why not get politicians or social protection people? Why the doctors? And at one level, what are you, it's a very interesting question, but at another level, it's a bizarre question. Doctors should not be interested in health who else should be interested in health but doctors? Now, I've been arguing that health is an outcome of how we arrange our societies, but we as doctors need to be crucially concerned with that. We are crucially concerned. That's why we go into medicine. And if we extend that, not simply to treating the sick, but addressing the conditions that make people sick, that seems a reasonable part of our role. So the question is, what next? I'm sufficient still of an epidemiologist to recognize potential biases when I see them, and that all the people who've come up to me have said what a wonderful meeting it was, but it may be the people who thought it was a complete waste of time haven't come up to me. So it could be biased reporting. Um, so I won't extrapolate that everybody thinks about the meeting the way the people who bothered to come up to me think about the meeting, but it's still a reasonable hypothesis that we've tapped into a well of enthusiasm. And as you said earlier, how then do we extend to the people who aren't here? That's okay. That's the next step. Uh, I think we've got a nub of enthusiasm the fact that 20 countries were represented here is terrific. And then we extend to those who are interested to get involved beyond the 20. We start small and we extend as people want to extend. I certainly take this as an endorsement of my plans, ambitions for my WMA presidency. 
um, and I will take it to the council meeting in Oslo next month uh, as I report back and our Canadian colleagues report back from this meeting to say I think we've had a ringing endorsement of what we'd like to do uh, and assuming the council approves it. The next step is then to build on this and work out how we can build the network, produce the report, start the educational activities that I've talked about. And my view is that I've got a wonderful group of colleagues with whom to work, and I look forward to taking this agenda forward. So I'm really grateful to all of you who've given up your precious time and come and made this, I think, a spectacularly successful meeting. Thank you all. All right, I think that uh, brings us to a close for the day, unless, Jenny, you have any surprises for us that weren't on my agenda. All right, well, thank you all for coming. I hope the conversation continues uh, uh, by email, by social media, and uh, until we meet again. Thank you.